A happy birthday, everybody at Oakland Motorcycle Club. Happy 100th anniversary. I'm Bob Gilbert. I've been a member of the club for 15 months, so since 1996. It's, uh, excuse me, that's 2006. I get confused in my old age. I've been riding motorcycles since 1963. Uh, my first motorcycle that I owned was a Triumph 650 Bonneville. And in that interval, since 1965, I've owned 14 different motorcycles. Currently, I'm the general manager of Bob Drone Harley-Davidson in Oakland, California. And I joined the club just because I got to know a lot of the uh, members come into the dealership, look like a great bunch of guys. I enjoy riding motorcycles. That's uh, my passion. I was a school teacher, a school administrator, high school principal for 10 years. and. In 1995, Bob Drone made me an offer I couldn't refuse, and I've been working with him ever since. I've been a member of the AMA since 1969 when I started riding Enduros on my Husky and my BSA Victor 441. And then I joined the SRRA when I moved to California with my family and was riding out here. In 1989, I did something that I said I would never do. I bought my first Harley. When I was a kid in Illinois, my cousin had Harleys and I was the guy with the Triumph. In those days, you couldn't ride a Harley without owning a pickup because you had to go pick them up all the time when they broke down. But I guess they finally got it right and since then it's been a lot of fun. It's changed my life and I've had a great time. I've been a member of the Oakland Hog Chapter since 1989 and then in 2006, I became a member of the Oakland uh, Motorcycle Club and it's been a, a lot of fun. I enjoyed the camaraderie, the history, the traditions, and the opportunities to ride. As I said, I used to ride in the dirt, ride enduros, but uh, my life became more complicated, it became more and more difficult for me to get off and do the dirt riding, so I sold all my dirt bikes in 1990, been strictly on the road. The, the riding that I really like to do is long distance touring. Uh, so four or five thousand mile trips are the kinds of things I like to do with two or three other guys. In between, I do things such as the AMA photo tours, I've done the lakes tours, and I'm doing the uh, Great Highway Tour right now, in addition to doing the Harley Owners Group ABCs of Touring, which we do every year. So it's uh, been fun. It's going to be fun. I look forward to a lot more years in the Oakland Motorcycle Club. Thanks. Oakland Motorcycle Club being 100 years old this year, there's a lot of tradition with the club. I've enjoyed history, though I haven't been a member of the club for more than 15 months, but been familiar with the club and some of the things that they've done. Uh, three years ago when the Oakland Hog Chapter was thinking of ideas of what they could do for their big run, which is Bikers Into Giving. We were sitting around one night over a few beers and we started talking about the old Lincoln Highway and one of the fellows in the club had uh, a history buff too and been at the Livermore Historical Society. And he said, you know, I saw an old picture out there and it showed about a thousand Harleys rallying around a flagpole back in 1911. And he said, I think it was a uh, a race that was sponsored by the Oakland Motorcycle Club. And the Lincoln Highway was not developed at that particular point in time, but the segments of the road which eventually became the Lincoln Highway were there. So we did a little more research and thought it would be cool to have a motorcycle poker run that followed the route of this race. And uh, doing a little more research and then we talked to uh, Mark Norris and Larry Stewart members of the Oakland Motorcycle Club and they came over to Bob Drone Harley Davidson one night with uh, some members of the Oakland Hog Chapter and we put together this idea and looked at some old pictures of having this ride recreate the race and the race was from the Oakland Motorcycle Clubhouse on Broadway in Oakland and it went up following again the basic route of the Lincoln Highway and ended up in downtown Livermore and the finish was the old wooden flagpole in downtown Livermore. And the OMC sponsored this race for three years, 1911, 12, and 13. And then things haven't changed very much. The Livermore Police Department put it, uh, the, the death, death knoll on this thing. I guess it got too loud, too rowdy. But I think back to 
a thousand motorcycles, you know, 1911, a thousand motorcycles in the Bay Area. And in those days, motorcycles were a primary means of transportation. But these pictures that we have, uh, that we gathered and, and, and have, I have two of them hanging in my office now because I think they're really cool, of uh, the start and the finish of this race that took place. So in working with the club and uh, putting this whole thing together, the, the OMC, it was really a, a great experience for us. And I think that the, the history, again, I love motorcycles. I love to ride. And I love anything associated with it. And at one time, I was a high school teacher and a principal, as I've stated. And I made that transition to, to change my life and to go into motorcycling. And uh, being a member of Oakland Hog, we meet on Wednesday nights, the third Wednesday. And we have our officers' meetings that I have to go to. On, they're on the second Wednesday, but every other Wednesday night I'm at the Oakland Motorcycle Clubhouse. And I think that a motorcycle club that's been going for a hundred years uh, strong over that long period is, is unique in itself. And now that I'm in the club, I can see why. The people that are here, they love all aspects of the sport, whether you have the dual sport ride in the spring, and the three bridges run for street bikes in the middle of the summer and concluding with the uh, enduro, the jackhammer in the fall. We're putting on major events that spread motorcycling and give everybody an opportunity to ride motorcycles. And then just being available, the clubhouse is always open for anybody that wants to drop in, come to a meeting, have a beer, socialize. Just this uh, last week, one of our customers, who's a member of the Iron Souls, who happened to be one of the winners of the low ball at the uh, Three Bridges run, came in and he cornered me for a half an hour and said that this was the greatest thing that he'd ever been to. He'd never been to our clubhouse before. He'd never been on a Three Bridges run before. And he just thought that the Oakland Motorcycle Club needed to be highly uh, applauded for what they've done. And this is just typical of, of, I think, what this motorcycle club stands for and the traditions and what the people and the members and the leadership gets passed on from one generation to the next. And so I'm proud to be a member of the club, and I hope that I can help carry on the tradition and, and spread the goodwill and joy of motorcycling that I've experienced these past 40-some years and hope that other people can experience the same things that I have. Again, happy birthday, Oakland Motorcycle Club. Hi, my name's Tom Rosa. Uh, I've been in the Oakland Motorcycle Club uh, since 1998. Uh, I'm a good friend of uh, Larry Stewart, and uh, him and I go back about probably 13 years now uh, as friends. We live in Alameda, and uh, I uh, noticed uh, one day he used to he hangs out, plays golf all the time, and he hangs out at the golf course. And a few times he came riding in on his motorcycle. He had a, uh, I think he had a. I know he had a, an Ultra Classic, and uh, he had another Harley, and uh, I've always thought they were pretty nice bikes. I was never really into riding at the time, and uh, so he was kind of encouraging me to, to give it a shot and try it out, and, and uh, so I, I thought I would, and uh, I went to school, took the, went to the driving school, and learned how to ride, and got my license and stuff, and finally I got out and started looking for motorcycles, and Larry and I went out to several dealerships, went to uh, Honda and Yamaha and Suzuki and, and uh, looking at different bikes and trying them out, sitting on them and trying to get a feel for what I'd like to ride. And, and I've always liked Harleys. I figured if I was going to get on a, a motorcycle, I'd get myself a Harley. I like Harleys. And so we went down to Bob Drones and I was looking at uh, bikes and I was easily sold. I uh, went ahead and got myself a, a Sportster, it's an 883, and uh, it's a small bike, I figured I'd start small and uh, see if I'd like it or not, and uh, I uh, definitely I fell in love with it immediately, and uh, and so uh, I went riding, Larry and I used to go riding around, he kind of took me out to uh, get a feel for it, got me used to riding on the freeway and stuff like that, and, and I really liked it, I really got into it, and uh, and I took a lot of crap for riding an 883, you know, riding a chick's bike, you know. But, uh, hey, what can I say? you got to start somewhere, you know. But I really enjoyed it. And I had that bike for a couple years. And uh, 
Larry wanted me to join the Oakland Motorcycle Club, and but he wanted to make sure I could ride, you know, with the club because the ride the club rides fast, and there's a lot of good riders in the club. So he took me out to uh, a few places. One time, him and uh, uh, John Rahowitz, they took me out to Hollister, and they both had John Rahowitz had a Road King, and Larry had his Ultra Classic. And so we went out there. I'm just riding. They're, they were uh, way out ahead of me, but I did my best staying up with them, and uh, they were gone. They were in the horizon, but uh, I kept riding, and I had a good time. I had a blast, and uh, so we went out to Hollister, had a good time, came back, and Larry thought he'd, uh, I'd be ready to join the Oakland Motorcycle Club, and uh, so I did. We, I, filled out an application and everything. It was kind of funny because when I when I joined, I only had like uh, uh, about 300 miles on my bike, and so I had that on my application, and I only been riding for uh, for three months. So uh, Virgil Garcia, I think, was the uh, he was the um, secretary at the time. I forget what it is. Anyways, they read my application, and while on my second reading, to make it sound a little bit better, instead of saying I've been writing for three months, they said I've been writing for 90 days. It, uh, the number was a little bit better. <laughs> so it's like, so uh, I got in the club and everything. I went writing, and uh, uh, I really enjoy the people in the club. It's a really good club. I like the camaraderie. Um, they, they're all in the different types of riding and stuff, and uh, um, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, one of the things I really like about the club is uh, going out riding and stuff, is uh, going on poker runs with other clubs, like the San Jose Dons and Capital City and stuff, you go out and you do their poker runs and you learn different areas uh, around the Bay Area and, and some good back roads and you meet different people and uh, stuff like that. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I, uh, I've learned a lot uh, being with the club, a lot of back roads. Uh, I feel pretty comfortable about riding around the Bay Area and going up in the Oakland Hills. There's areas just around the, the East Bay and stuff that I never even knew existed. I started riding with the Oakland Motorcycle Club, and uh, it's really good. You get some good experience. Uh, you learn a lot of new things from people. Um, uh, that's like going to the meetings in, in, with the club. is uh, about safety talk. You, you learn a lot of stuff. A lot of the things that they br bring up in safety talk, it, uh, it sticks in the back of your mind. And when you're out on the road, um, you don't forget those little things and stuff like that. I remember one time they picked me as road captain. We went to Capital City. They had their poker run, and uh, we went riding. They they made me the road captain on this run, and uh, they had these little lime lights lines on the street that you had to look for to make a right or a left or whatever. Well, one time we came to an intersection, and I was looking for them, and I couldn't find them, but the light was red, and all of a sudden it dawned on me that uh, I was like, I had no time to stop, so I slammed on the brake. I slid out in the middle of the intersection. I look in my mirror. Everybody's like about 30 feet behind me, like going, looking at me like, what's he doing? And uh, I've come back and up. Nothing happened. It was no close call or anything. And uh, I felt kind of kind of small, but uh, we get through the intersection, everything's cool, I'm kind of laughing about the whole thing, and I'll never forget it, Mark Norris came up to me, and he goes, you know what you did wrong? And I said, no, I really don't. He goes, you put on too much back brake, man. He goes, first thing you want to do is grab that front brake, and it's one thing, I, I never forgot that, I've never forgotten that, and I've always, I always use my front brake, and uh, I've never slammed on my brakes ever since. I've been, been lucky. And uh, uh, it's just something, it was a learning experience. And little things like that, being with a club like the OMC, you, uh, you don't forget those things. And it, it's good for your writing skills and stuff like that. And uh, so it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. Um, I remember one time I'd never done any dirt riding. And, uh, and Brent and Tracy invited me up to, to Hollister with them to ride, and, and Tracy had a, a Honda uh, 
I think it's a 250 RC or CR, I forget what, what kind of bike it was, a Honda, it's a 250, and uh, we went dirt riding. Well, I got in a bad accident just off the start. I went down into a, a ditch. I was being trying to be real careful, and uh, I, we hit some, some mud, and uh, all of a sudden I grabbed the throttle. Next thing you know, I'm out of control. I crashed down into a ditch about six, six feet deep, and messed up my knee and bruised a couple of ribs and and uh, it wasn't starting off too good but I got back on it and I remember it was, it was kind of funny because I got back on and I told Tracy I go well, I'm just gonna go back this way and go back to the trail and kind of practice riding and stuff and uh, she goes uh, you can't she goes it's one way you have to you have to continue on I'm like on okay so we're just starting I went up the trail and got myself up to the top and we came down Tom Crone they already got word at the top of the hill that what had happened to me and Tom Crone everybody's stripping off uh, safety equipment and giving it to me and make sure I was okay and it's kind of I got down to the bottom of the hill went the 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 one way got down to the bottom hill and went riding up and down the dirt trail and stuff to get used to the bike and I rode out the rest of the day I had a good time unfortunately it, it the accident kind of put a little bit of a damper on the whole thing, but uh, I had fun, and uh, it took me about uh, six months to fully recover from my injuries, but uh, it was fun. I haven't done it since, but I'd like to give it another shot, and uh, no, it's fun, and it, I just like the, the camaraderie and the, and the company with the OMC. They're all good people, really good people. Hi, I'm John Notch. I'm with the Oakland Motorcycle Club and have been for about three years, maybe five years. I sometimes don't keep track. It's sometimes when you're having so much fun, time seems to slip away. I have a business in San Leandro. Some people call me uh, their man in heat. I do fireplaces and hot tubs. So uh, whatever you want to choose, we do it all at Top Notch Energy and Spas. How I was introduced to the club? Well, we had a friend. Bob Turtletop, who was a member for several years, came in and looked at some stoves and bought a stove for his home in the Laurel District of Oakland. He had a motorcycle in his basement and I thought it was very beautiful and he recommended that maybe I join the club and so I came down and had a beer. And I'm still going there and having a beer and I don't stop at one beer, sometimes I have several. But I've had several great times with the Oakland Motorcycle Club. It's been a time of memories, time when I went with Tom Crone. He was the road captain, and we went to Death Valley and stayed overnight. And the tents blew over while we were all staying there. And my bike fell over because I put my kickstand down. It's Death Valley, you know, and it's pretty sandy, so. Sometimes kickstands don't stand up very well in the sand and <laughs> son of a bitch damn motorcycle fell over and so I got one of those uh, Bone or a bell or some kind of thing like that. So I'm starting to learn about the bone and the bell at uh, my little experience at uh, Death Valley but one of my better experiences was taking a two-week trip with Mark Norris I remember Mark and I think he along with Chris uh, Chris Vetter led the trip to Cabo San Lucas a couple years back and I went with my reliable for a while BMW R1100 RS until it started making a lot of noise one of the fun things was bringing some uh, coffee with me I had my espresso machine with fresh coffee in Mexico and I remember Dean and Mary Chowan Hill they said I want to know which room John not just standing because he's got the best coffee on the friggin trip but there was one time that uh, I expect I remember uh, there and it was a song when we finally got to Cabo area and I remember Virgil Virgil in the club sang the song and the song talks about a white sandy beach and it goes I saw you in my dreams we were walking hand in hand on a white sandy beach of Hawaii we were
were playing in the sun. We were having so much fun on a white sandy beach of Hawaii. Sounds of the ocean soothe my restless soul. Sounds of the ocean rocks me all night long. Those long hot summer days, lying there in the sun on a white sandy beach of Hawaii. Sound of the ocean soothes my restless soul. Sounds of the ocean rocks me all night long. Last night in my dreams, I saw your face again. We were there in the sun on a white sandy beach of Hawaii. On a white sandy beach of Hawaii. The beaches in Cabo San Lucas were fantastic. And then we went on to Las Barrias. And my friend Carla, here by my, by my side, an OMCA member, was just very smart. She flew down to Cabo San Lucas. She flew down, didn't ride on the motorcycle. She joined me for five days, two of which were in Cabo, three of which were in Los Brias. And on the way to Los Brias from Cabo, my sister, Kathleen Notch, had a little restaurant in San Jose del Cabo where we had breakfast. We had a great time there. And on the way back, I remember Sandy Vetter was saying that, John, your motorcycle looks like the Sea of Cortez Blue. But all the way home, still drinking that wonderful espresso coffee and Mary Chow, you know, trying to find my room. I remember that so much. But the club has been a fun place for me, a place where the, it's the camaraderie, the camaraderie of people. And, uh, and uh, so I'm a proud member of being a, of a, the OMCA and or, um, the OMC. I'm OMCA kind of, but I'm not really. I'm just really OMCA kind of guy. So I think that uh, we, I look forward to many very great memories of the OMCA and uh, camping trips. I hear so much history. One of my golfing friends is Don Demers, and uh, he's kind of like one of the godfathers of the OMCA. OMC. And uh, anyway, look forward to the upcoming next weekend, the halfway run. So, mahalo nui loa, and I will talk to you again soon. As they say, say in Hawaii, aloha no, a mea hui ho kaua. I'm Carla, and I'm here because of John. I've been a member of OMCA for a year, and I've been uh, kind of hanging out at the clubhouse for a couple of years now. And um, some of the highlights have been um, my trip to Lake Topaz on the back of the bike. Uh, maybe that was my first longest trip. And uh, great trip, great people, wonderful time, beautiful weather. And coming back, we came across, I think it was the Sonora Pass, and there was, it was packed with snow, and that was great. Um, the other trip was um, to Cabo San Lucas. However, I flew, uh, met all of them there, and uh, got on the back of the bike, and uh, traveled from Cabo San Lucas to Las Barrias. Great house that we rented there with everyone and um, great beach and a great time and wonderful people. They've always been great and um, I think the thing I like the best about the group is how they're all 
together all the time. I mean, even holidays, um, Thanksgiving, Christmas, they're always together. And uh, so they're like a big family. Uh, let's see. The get-togethers at the clubhouse. Um, the Wright's Beach Camp. Oh, yeah, I forgot Wright's Beach. And that was great. And we just had this fantastic time. It rained the first night. And uh, we had kind of a leaky uh, trailer that we were in. But we survived and uh, hiked the next day. And beautiful weather after that. That was a great trip. So I've enjoyed it. It's been fun. Enjoy the ladies in the OMCA and uh, the uh, great OMC family. It's been wonderful. Hi, I'm John again from uh, the Oakland Motorcycle Club and a couple of other memories I have with the Motorcycle Club are with taking the club to a luau trip on the island of Bradford, Bradford Island, where we all gathered and we took a ferry boat, the Jersey Island Ferry from Jersey Island Road all the way over to the Bradford Island. And in doing so, I took the club on a detour. We went and we did a shortcut, or in Hawaii they say, cut short. And we uh, turned left and went through some brambling bushes. And I know Carla's brand new car, two weeks old, got scratched up. And Larry and Emma Fry, they just bitched and bitched and bitched about the bad road I went on. But all in all, on this island, which is only an hour away here from the Bay Area, but you're so, my, so many miles away, very peaceful at night, stars stars shine so it was a great ride and we all went back on the ferry the next day and memory great me many great memories were made on that trip in Bradford Island and one day soon I hope to take the club on another one of those rides and then we had the opening day ride of 07 I remember uh, a little friend of mine he's a friend Gary Christiani he's a member of the club He's kind of like a guy with a short man's complex. He always got shiny shoes. This shines like his head. But he is a real dude. He came with his Harley Davidson. Sometimes these guys with Harley Davidsons have a small man's complex. A lot of them don't, but anyway, Gary, he's, he's a sweetheart in his own little way. But he came and, and uh, it was fun going on the ride following Paul Gregerson, our road captain. What a great ride we had, and very funny coincidence happened as we were heading up Broadway Terrace. My good buddy on a white sandy beach, Virgil, crashed into a mailbox, and he dropped his brand new GS BMW. Had to pay for the damn mailbox. But damn, it was a lot of fun. And we all laughed. It's just like a family, the old Oakland Motorcycle Club. And they talk about uh, keep your eyes on the hands in the Motorcycle Club because you're always watching what your, your hands are doing and everybody else's eyes are doing. And like Larry Fry said, as they took off on the recent Lake Topaz trip, make sure your tanks are full and your bladders are empty. But this song talks about keep your eyes on the hands. Whenever you're watching a hula girl dance, you better be careful, you're tempting romance. Don't keep your eyes on her hips, her naughty hula hips. Just keep your eyes on her hands. Remember, she's telling a story to you. Her opu is swaying, but don't watch the view. Don't concentrate on the swing, it doesn't mean a thing. Keep your eyes on the hands. And when she goes around the island swing, her hips so tantalizing, keep your eyes where they belong. And when her grass skirts goes a swishing, keep your head and don't be wishing that 
you would like to mow the lawn. Your eyes are revealing, no fooling no one. No use in concealing, we're having some fun. But if you're too young to date, or over 98, just keep your eyes on the hens, they tell the story. Just keep your eyes on the hens, I really mean it. Just keep your eyes on the hens. Thank you, Oakland Motorcycle Club. Aloha. I wanted to talk a little bit about the cruise, the um, 2007 100 year anniversary cruise that we went on uh, with uh, 42, 52 people, I think. And it started in, uh, actually it started at the uh, San Francisco airport where we met everyone there and then we took off and we flew to Miami and boarded the ship and had a week of fun. It was great. Anywhere you were on the ship, you'd run into somebody from OMC on the ship. Uh, want to tell a story? I think the, the trip was wonderful. We all flew into Miami. We got into Miami and there were about seven to eight uh, Canadians there. Uh, they weren't in their rooms, they were at the bar. <laughs> Hello, where are <laughs> will the OMCA Canadian members be? Or the GVMC? They be at the bar. These guys like to drink. The first person I knew that went to go greet them was the godfather, Don Demers. <laughs> And yes, he had a few glasses, well, a few bottles of uh, Chardonnay. And no, they did not have the two-buck chuck there in uh, Miami. They had the Tisdale, the special $2 bottle of Chardonnay. <laughs> anyway, we had a great time there. We were very getting loosened up. We, we loosened ourselves up there in the Miami Hotel. And it was great. Wilna Shots did the tour. And then... and. Uh, you know, let's uh, three cheers for Wilna. She did a great job. She was in the tour business before, going to General Grinding, working for her husband, Dirk. But uh, it was a great trip. Then we went on to Miami in the morning. We boarded the ship. And it was like, uh, aloha oi, aloha oi, as we board boarded the ship. And we went out down the waterfront where they film... Miami Vice and all these various shots that they film on this causeway there in Miami Beach and we were leaving it and having a great time. We stopped in the Virgin Islands and it was a wonderful trip and uh, some people had some bills on the ship more than two thousand dollars for their drinking so uh, you can tell that we had fun on the ship. Carla, some of your other memories. Uh, the evenings, I guess, the shows, the lot of drinking, a lot of eating. Um, uh, we celebrated uh, the wedding of Kelly and Smitty. And Smitty. Um, we had a get-together one night, a pre-formal party get-together. That pre-formal party, I was fined. Or they wanted to give me the bone because I came <laughs> wearing Carla's tank top. <laughs> Hello, I wear an extra large. That night, I wore an extra small. <laughs> I came with my shorts on and my extra small OMC tank top, and I was not received very well. And that was only the first time. Mr. Bob Davidson, Mr. Bob, the old man of the club hall there, he was very upset with me one night when I came to dinner wearing my hat. I got a beautiful Bahama hat in the Panama area, Panama hat, and I wore it to dinner once and I kept it on through dinner. Again, mashed potatoes, garlic mashed potatoes taste so much better when you're wearing your Panama hat. So I'm here, I'm wearing my Panama hat. What do I catch in the morning from Bob Davidson? Nothing but shit. He gives me shit, shit, shit. It's the Bob Davidson. So anyway, I'm still proud to be a member of the Oakland Old Motorcycle Club. As much shit as I get from this Bob Davidson fellow. 
Thank you. I'm Buzz Dare, uh, been a member of the Oakland Motorcycle Club for about 22 years. Uh, I used to work for the railroad. I was a, a conductor engineer for the Southern Pacific and Union Pacific Railroad for 49 years. Retired about three and a half years ago. Uh, I thought when I retired I'd have more time to ride, but it uh, seems like after you retire you have less time. So. Uh, I heard that from a lot of guys is before the retirement, now I know it's true. Uh, I live in Fremont, California. Uh, and how I happened to uh, start out with the Oakland Motorcycle Club was through a couple other guys that I worked with on the railroad. Uh, I'd heard about the club for many years, but I never uh, realized what a great club there was. Before I even uh, was invited to come down, about a year before, when I was a conductor on a passenger train between, between Oakland and Reno, uh, there were a whole bunch of club members from Oakland Motorcycle Club going to Reno for the, on the fun train. And uh, there was one fellow in particular that I, I got to know and got to be friends with as we now known as Bob Davidson, the Silver Fox. Well, uh, it was a fun trip, uh, having the, 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 all the members each way, but I didn't really know anything about the club at the time. And about a year later, when I was working with uh, another conductor named Jack Duncan, someone mentioned to me that Jack was a member of the o OMC. So uh, when I got him aside, I said, hey, what about this Oakland Motorcycle Club? I hear all kind of good things about it. And bear in mind, I'd forgotten about the, the trip that the club had made with me on the train. And he said, well, why don't you come down some, uh, some Wednesday night? I'll, uh, I'll introduce you, so, which, which I did a few weeks later. And uh, Jack Duncan and his brother, Mike Duncan, were the sponsors for me when I joined the club. Uh, as it turns out, their father had been a member of Oakland Motorcycle Club for a long time. He also worked on the railroad. Anyway, while I was in the club meeting that night, I, I noticed this guy behind the bar, and I couldn't figure out where I knew him from, and we were talking to each other, and he couldn't figure out where he knew me from. So when, when I did uh, turn in my application, and I was standing up in front of the club telling everyone uh, what I did for a living, and I worked on the railroad, Bob Davidson yelled out across the bar, hey, you were the conductor on the, on the uh, fun train. That's where we know. So, so it's been a long love affair especially with that guy, the old Silver Fox. What a great guy he is, and we won't let anyone else be a bartender. Uh, of course, uh, he doesn't have much competition, but great bartender and a great guy, too. Uh, I was in the club about a year or so before I took on a, or was nominated for an officer and I think my the first post I held was uh, tr secretary about two or three times in a row. I forget now how many times, but I, I do recall that when, when I was uh, up at the table as secretary, one of the, some of the best times that I had sitting up there was when Mike Duncan was president, because he made it fun. He was, what a character he was. And another time also was Gary Cristiani when he was president. Those two guys made it fun, at least for me anyway, and for the members. Some of the, the things that they came out with and the way they handled things. Uh, then after that, I think I was vice president for a, for a term. Uh, and I haven't been, in, been an officer for some time now. Well, I've been in, uh, as I said, I've been in the Oakland Motorcycle Club for 22 years. I joined in 1985. And this year we're celebrating the 100 years for a club that uh, has had a lot of things going on. Uh, a lot of history and a lot of tradition. 
as I understand it, in the old days, they, they rode Harleys and Indians. And when I joined in 1985, there was only one Harley rider in the club. He's no longer around at the time. Uh, at the time I joined, I had a 1980 Yamaha 1100 XS, which was supposed to be the fastest street bike at the time. And uh, just before that, uh, a friend of mine who owned the Fremont Yamaha shop was trying to talk me into buying a, their Venture Royale, the new model that had just come out. And I sat on it, and I said, ah, this is a big old boat, I wouldn't have this thing. And then I joined the Oakland Motorcycle Club, and uh, the bike I had was able to keep up with the riders, but it didn't have the stereo, and it didn't have the comfort, and some of the other things that go with that dresser. So uh, I went back to my friend at Fremont Yamaha, and he gave me one heck of a deal. So I had that uh, Yamaha Venture Royale for several years. And it was a good thing I did because some of the long rides we went on, the, that bike made it worthwhile, made the ride worthwhile. and It was a really comfortable bike. But I was, still wasn't happy, so I, I, I still wanted a Harley. So uh, in f fact, I think I bought, yeah, I bought a, a used uh, lowrider. Harley Davidson Lowrider, uh, just the same year. So I had, at the time I had three bikes. There's a lot of members in the club have more than one. In fact, I know one that I heard last I heard he had 18 bikes. In fact, he has one that I sold him 10 years ago. Uh, as I said, when I joined the club, there was only one Harley rider. Uh, then as time went by, a few more members came in with Harleys and other present members bought Harley Davidson, so it looked like Harley was coming back for a while. Because a lot of the members had Hondas and uh, other type of Japanese bikes. I think Don Turkletop was the first member to buy the, the first Honda from the stories I've heard. And now it's uh, a lot of the members, if not the majority of them, Ride Beamers. I even tried one out a couple of years ago, but Harley's my forte, so I'm back to riding the Harley, which I have a, night, or a 2005 uh, Electric Glide Classic, which is pumped up to 95 inches and is really a great bike. Even has a stereo on it, which I didn't have on the Harley before. I'd like to say one of, a couple of my favorite rides uh, is the Stag Run. And the halfway run. First year I did the halfway run was 1987. And, uh, a member of the club, Jack Duncan and his wife, and my wife and I rode up to Coburg, Oregon to meet the sister club uh, from Canada, which we do every other year. Uh, that was one, one heck of an adventure. Uh, really great ride, and we had some great times. If you look at the calendar, you'll see that there was a picture in there of the the halfway run, of course, the calendar says has a different date on it, but it was 1987. Uh, the other favorite run, as I stated, is the stag run, which uh, the guys get out and and have a great time together. They don't tell uh, anyone where we're or the, Usually, the road captain doesn't tell where we're going, and sometimes it's a surprise. Sometimes it isn't. Uh, but uh, that's one of the best runs. And also we have the three bridge run, which is uh, a lot of fun. The members work the three bridge run instead of riding it. Once in a while they do, but it's uh, a lot of fun and camaraderie. Uh, when we put on these runs, we see members from other clubs that come in. And when, when I joined in 1985, uh, I had also just joined the Harley Owners Group. But uh, we didn't have a Harley's owner group, Harley owner group in the Bay Area at the time. Uh, and then when the Oakland Hogs started, uh, I became a member of the Oakland Hogs. That was 1988. And then I was a charter member of the Fremont Harley owners group and vice president of that for a couple of years. Uh, kind of funny thing is, I, even though those Hog members were pretty good riders, especially the old-time Harley riders, I told them in a couple of meetings they could never keep up with the Oakland Motorcycle Club the way the guys in the OMC rode. Uh, I can remember 
going out on some of the first. I thought I knew how to ride till I joined the OMC, and I learned a lot more after doing so. Uh, I can remember going on rides where we would be on a run from another club, and we would start out, hit the first bar we came to, have a few drinks, start out again, go around everybody, hit another bar, come out of that bar, go around all these. In fact, uh, we went around so many other clubs heading for the next bar. We, we uh, got complained about a few times. Uh, people didn't like the way we did things. And then we would ride into the last checkpoint just in time to make it under the gun. That was one of the great things about the Oakland Motorcycle Club that I love. And at that time, it was, uh, it was all men. It was all men's club. When they started the, Har the Harley Clubs, uh, there were a few women that were members. And now, of course, there are a lot of women members in the Hog Clubs. But in the Oakland Motorcycle Club, it's been a tradition for 90, or at that time, uh, almost 80 years. It was all men and, and has been until just a few years ago. I guess I'm a traditionalist and yeah, I look at things, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But that was one of the things I enjoyed about the Oakland Motorcycle Club, being able to brag to people, this is just a men's club. We have women's auxiliary and we love the women, but we kind of like uh, just we being able to say what we want to say and not have to apologize to, to the women, although we don't really get out of hand when we cuss and swear and you know. I can remember some of the old members standing up uh, saying things that during the meeting that you don't hear anymore because now we have ladies in the audience or as members also. Now there are a lot of motorcycle clubs around, a lot of clubs around in the Bay Area in fact. But I always like telling uh, stories about our club and some of the things uh, that are in our, archi our, our archives and pictures that we have in the club that show the history of the club. And one of, the, one of my favorite things to tell people that haven't been to the club or ones that come to the club for the first time is to go upstairs and look at the picture of a man sitting on a motorcycle with his son, about a three-year-old son, sitting on the tank of the motorcycle. Back in the in the uh, 30s, I believe. I know the man that's sitting on the old Harley, his last name was Mattis, and I don't remember his first name, but he used to be president of the Oakland Motorcycle Club back in the old, old days before my time. And the little boy sitting on the tank of his Harley was George Mattis, who later became a member of our club uh, a few years back. And that, George, that little boy now is 76 years old. And he's still riding, and he's riding a Harley. Uh, he's not a member of the club right now because of, uh, uh, mainly because of the way that some of the bylaws were changed. And uh, when we uh, had the problem of having women members, he decided uh, it wasn't for him, so he quit coming around. But I still ride with him every once in a while on weekends. He goes out with a few other guys, and I. He's 70, I think he's 76. And he can still ride like he's 25. What an amazing guy. That's one of the stories I like telling about the club. Uh, one of the other stories was uh, uh, Howard Self, who used to be a member. For 57 years, at the time uh, I joined the club, he'd probably been a member for uh, close to 50, because I forget what year he died, but I, I can remember Howard being like the godfather, not, not the godfather, but the, the, the patriarch of the club. Uh, members would have different opinions about things we do in the club and changing rules and rides, and Howard would just sit and listen to everything. And there would be arguments and discussions, and we, people would disagree, and Howard would raise his hand and stand up. And when he was called on, he would stand up and make his little speech, and Every time the club went along with what Howard Self had to say. Howard was the prince of a man and everyone loved him. And he's, uh, I can remember riding in the rain one day when Howard was around, eight, around 80 years old. And the bike I had was faster than his, but I guess I could see him in my mirror right behind me. So I, not that, I, uh, that he couldn't have passed me anyway, because I don't think he could have because of the speed of my bike, but I slowed down 
just to see that guy pass me because uh, it was an honor knowing Howard Self. I still have a keep a copy in my vest pocket of uh, the drink that Howard, of a recipe for a drink that Howard made, uh, call it Howard Self's Fizz. I think there's another name for it, but that's what I call it. Uh, for members that come to the club that have never been there before, they're always in awe when they look around and see all the, the history that we have, the trophies that we have. And another thing that uh, we do now, which we used to do, was uh, is uh, read minutes from the old days. That's another story I tell people about. Uh, one of the stories that uh, are told back in, in the 20s or 30s when the club would go for a ride down to Mark, uh, down to Modesto or Tracy, and they'd get stuck in the mud and get pulled out of the mud by horses. And some of them would get thrown in jail for the weekend for being drunk and disorderly. Uh, those are in the minutes from from the old days. Uh, another member who isn't with us anymore is Don Turkletop. Uh, was one of the first guys that made friends with me when, after joining the club, uh, who also rode a Yamaha Venture Royale at the time. Uh, I like telling the story how he was such a great hill climber. I, I always told everyone he was a world champion hill climber and if he heard about it he'd remind me no I was only second best but I considered Don Turkletop who's a, a legend and his brother's still around uh, Bob Turkletop. He's a living legend. Uh, the Turkletops have done a lot of things for the club as have a lot of members, uh, if not most of the members. It's a great club, and even though I belong to two Harley clubs, I still belong to the Fremont Harley Club. Uh, the Oakland Motorcycle Club is, is the best. There's not another club around like it, even though we have our disagreements. And one of the times I remember is when we, there were some clubs wanted to change the color of the jackets to, to black because someone had made some black jackets with orange uh, writing and orange uh, orange logo on the back and there was a lot of disagreement that was another time Howard Self got up and made a little speech but anyway we were going to have a vote on it whether to have orange or black because the colors of Oakland Motorcycle Club is orange and black mainly orange so at the night that we were going to vote on it members came out of the woodworks that hadn't been there for for months or maybe not even years members who were dead set against having black were making phone calls and as it turned out, uh, the black went down. The oranges became uh, the main, orange and black became the main color and still is, although we do have a black jacket this year for 100th uh, anniversary. So, uh, who knows how things will go in the future. One of the other members uh, of our club, one of my favorite people, the Godfather, uh, of course, his name is Don Demers. But from what I understand, he got the nickname Godfather because before I joined, the club was meeting up on San Pablo uh, for a number of years, and it became so unsafe to hold a meeting there, you had to start packing a gun to, uh, to go to a meeting and protect your motorcycles. I was told that one guy had to sit at the window and look out all the time to keep an eye on the motorcycles. Uh, even Gary Christiani, uh, had to fake drawing a gun out of his jacket one night when he was being approached by uh, someone on the street that looked like he was going to maybe cause, uh, bring on a robbery. Anyway, it, so the club started looking around for uh, some place to move and they bought the present building and turned it into a club. And the stories I hear is that uh, Don Demers uh, put his house up uh, for, for collateral to help build and help pay for the the building which we have now. So if the story's true, that's how uh, he got the name Godfather. And I've been on many a run when Don Demers was road captain and what a ride he did present because the road captain has to come up with a run, inform the run, and uh, be the leader. And it was a lot of fun riding with Don Demers as road captain. Fry Guy, another great road captain. He, these guys can make come up with uh, ideas to make the, the run entertaining, uh, something you want to look forward to because they make it, make it fun. I remember one time when uh, uh, McCusker was road captain 
about halfway during the run, and we pulled over to a stop, and there was someone with uh, champagne and and uh, treats to eat. Uh, I think Fry Guy did that too, because Fry used to drink champagne all the time. One of the other uh, runs I remember is on the halfway run out of Susanville, when we're all clicking along at about 80 or 90 miles an hour, and with about 50 of us, uh, the uh, sweeper radioed to the road captain, uh, well, we got the black and white here behind us wanting us to pull over. So we all pulled over, and when the highway patrol got down and uh, talked to Gary Christiani, who was a road captain that time, uh, he complained that uh, after talking to Gary, because Gary used to be a, uh, uh, worked for the Alameda Sheriff's Department, Gary gave him a line of some kind of bull. I, I didn't hear the conversation. The guy told him that, uh, told Gary you didn't have enough tickets to write everybody, but to keep the speed down because people were calling from cars and homes, telling them they need to get out here and get this motorcycle gang because they're going too fast. And so Gary promised them that, that we'd be good, so he let us go. And of course, as, you would, as uh, luck would have it, a few miles down the road, the Oakland Motorcycle Club was up to their old tricks again, crossing over the double line to get around cars. Uh, but everybody stayed together. Uh, no one got lost. Of course, that's what the sweeper's for, but the way the OMC used to ride and uh, I suppose still does, greatest uh, motorcycle club I've ever ridden with, and I've ridden with a bunch. Good afternoon, club. My name is John Rahowitz. And howdy, I'm John Rahowitz, uh, better known as Geese in some circles. And I've been a member of the club for about four years, and I'd have to say it's been one of the most interesting and fun four years of my life. Um, I was recruited uh, for membership in the club for a good number of years prior to that, and had ridden with the club on a number of occasions. And my sponsor and mentor and one of my heroes is uh, Larry Stewart. And one time Larry and his uh, salesmanship was trying to convince me to become a member and said, uh, well, we meet every Wednesday night. And I thought to myself, well, how in the world can anything be interesting enough to meet every Wednesday night? Well, now, having been a member for about four years, I find when I miss Wednesday night meetings that I'm kind of out of the groove. It's uh, a real disappointment because our meetings, in addition to our runs and our other social activities, are just a heck of a lot of fun and a very pleasurable way to spend an evening. Um, a lot of people are curious about um, how I got the nickname Geese. Actually, I brought the nickname with me because um, prior to joining the club, I thought I'd clean up my act a little bit, uh, change my lifestyle, and uh, get with a different uh, community, namely the motorcycle community. So I brought the name Geese with me because I was a longtime geezer. This is a picture of me before uh, I joined the club, before I cleaned up my act. And uh, once you see this picture, you'll know why I'm uh, called the Geese. At any rate, uh, it's also a uh, reminder to myself that I'm one of the older members of the club, um, having just surpassed 71 years of age this past June. And I like to consider myself still an active motorcycle rider. I am the uh, proud owner of eight different motorcycles. As uh, some would say, I got the disease pretty badly. And I've got round heels when it comes to pretty motorcycles, and it won't probably be too long before I have number nine somewhere along the way. Uh, I have uh, a motorcycle that I park in England uh, that I've been to uh, most of continental Europe, uh, including, um, well, I took a, I, I borrowed a, a friend's bike, uh, Lindsay, uh, who's a, who's a uh, member of our club. I borrowed his bike to take a trip to Morocco, and that's when I first started uh, touring around in Europe. And um, since then, I have a number of uh, English friends that uh, are, are continental tours, so I've gone on a good number of trips in Europe. Uh, seven motorcycles that I have at home are crowned by uh, Harley-Davidson Road King, and I think three BMWs at the current count. And uh, uh, an ancient Su Suzuki, which uh, is in some state of uh, restore, which it's been in the same state for quite some time. And uh, I've got a little Suzuki dual sport that I like to go putting around in the dirt. 
Not that I can ride very fast, but putting around is fun. And I just uh, succumbed to the most beautiful motorcycle I've ever owned in my life. I bought a brand new, this is my last brand new bike, a brand new uh, Ducati Monster in bright red. And it is absolutely gorgeous, and it's a pure blast to ride. I'd like to comment briefly on uh, what I find so interesting about the club. Um, obviously, when you have a group of people that you like to ride with, uh, you do a lot more riding than you would uh, by yourself. You learn a lot more about riding. You become a better rider. And uh, there is a community about it. I'm very proud to be a part of the motorcycle community. I've been a part of several communities in my life, a mountaineering community climbing community, boating community, and the uh, corporate community. And the motorcycle community is the most generous, uh, considerate, um, compassionate group of people I've ever been involved with. Uh, I believe that nationwide motorcyclists raise more money for charitable causes than any other group of people. And from that point of view, it's a pleasure to be affiliated with uh, people of that eye or that ilk. Um, in addition to that, just the camaraderie, the, uh, the fun, the uh, social activities, uh, it's a good place to uh, see to it you're kept off the streets, so to speak, because without those kinds of activities, uh, a person like me can get into a little bit of trouble, which I've been in before, but <laughs> we're not going to talk about that. At any rate, uh, my membership in the club for the last four years, quite frankly, has been a savior for me. And uh, I now find myself at my advanced age looking forward, not really looking forward, but having to move uh, to another city uh, to spend my golden years uh, closer to my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. The more I contemplate this move, the sadder I get about what I'm leaving behind. And not only am I leaving behind uh, my favored place to live and a good number of acquaintances and friends and uh, social activities, but I'm leaving behind this club with all of its uh, wonderful members and friendships and laughs and giggles and wonderful rides. And I've looked uh, on, the, um, uh, on the radar scope to the city where I'm moving, San Diego, to see if there isn't some comparable motorcycle organization down there that I could join. Believe me, there isn't. And I think that you could look far and wide and you're not going to find a motorcycle club that has this level of activity, intensity, comradeship, friendship, and is a true family. Uh, for that reason, I'm quite distressed about my uh, forthcoming move. But I will be taking advantage of uh, having transportation back and forth and coming up uh, three or four times a year and spend a couple of weeks at a time, especially when we have uh, interest rides going on. And other fellows, I think, have uh, talked about um, some of their most interesting rides. Um, I have a couple that I really enjoy, uh, and uh, interestingly enough, one of them was yesterday, the uh, Highway 1 ride that we annually put on. Larry Stewart and myself uh, run it. And I get to be the road captain on that run. And we are blessed here in Northern California with some of the finest riding roads you could ever imagine. Uh, even in Europe, uh, there are seldom are roads that could compare with the roads we have here in the countryside we have available to us. And riding north of the Bay Area, up Highway 1, through the inland areas as well with the ranch lands and the farming communities and the beautiful roads and hills and twisties is just a marvelous opportunity and have the privilege of being able to have a road be the road captain on such a run is uh, is a is a great privilege and I'm going to try to continue doing that even when I'm gone because I um, I will be up here especially for the highway one run and we try to do something different every year put in a different location a different activity and try to make it a, an interesting surprise every year. And we rode yesterday 257 miles and uh, 
Had a wonderful lunch, including uh, oysters on the half shell and clam chowder and French bread and uh, stopped at another place called Bolinas where there's a bunch of burned out hippies that are uh, up there trying to uh, hide their community by uh, cutting down the road signs, directing people to it. They don't want anybody there. So we have a lot of interesting places to go on a Highway 1 run and we've got more to come. Among the other uh, interesting things that we do uh, in the club for rides is uh, we have occasionally an unannounced, unscheduled geezer ride. And the geezer ride is especially for us older folks who don't have to work for a living, who uh, are, are capable of taking a ride in uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. And we get the roads all to ourselves and the campgrounds all to ourselves, and so we pick out an interesting place to go with uh, interesting campsites. Uh, you, camping is required to be a geezer. And you're a double geezer if it happens to rain because we do not back out if, uh, if the rain is uh, in the forecast. And uh, actually to get your geezer badge you need to camp out in the rain once. So we've had a, a number of fun geezer rides. We hope going to uh, continue that uh, little exercise as we have new and new geezers coming on, older and older members coming on all the time. Speaking of older members, one of my uh, responsibilities of late has been to uh, keep track of people's birthdays and uh, monthly uh, announce people's uh, birthday for that month, uh, what day they were born, what year they were born, and uh, they get a free drink uh, on, in honor of their birthday if they happen to be there on the announcement day. And uh, one of the things I'm concerned about, uh, uh, I've had a lot of fun putting that together because uh, trying to make it light and airy and say a little bit about what happens on, what has historically happened on somebody's birthday or who they might share a birthday with. And I also pass along a little wisdom from the geezer community, uh, call, we call it geezer wisdom. But uh, everybody seems to have a good time with it and I especially have a good time putting it all together. But one of the things that causes me concern about it is looking at the uh, 93 members that we have and looking at the average ages of them. And I, uh, every month when I do this, I give a senescent report, which uh, speaks to how old these six people, eight people, however many, are having a birthday that month. Oh, by the way, uh, they, they're not birthday celebrants, they're, they're birthday celibates. And uh, most of our guys are old enough that... Uh, they no longer can celebrate, so they are celibates. But at any rate, the advancing age of our club sometimes gives me concern. And it means a couple of things. It means we're very, very experienced, but it also means I think we need new blood, and I think we ought to all take it upon ourselves to encourage new blood to come into the um, club. Uh, I would like to comment on uh, a couple, three heroes of mine in the club. Uh, um, firstly, uh, Larry Stewart, who is my mentor, my hero, he my sponsor, and I enjoy uh, very much my uh, my friendship with Larry and all of our writing experiences that we've had over the years. I feel like I'm a member of uh, Larry's family in a way. And uh, I also rode uh, quite frequently with um, Tom Rosa before I actually became a member of the club, so I enjoy that relationship as well. But I have a couple of riding heroes that impress me a lot. Uh, they impress me because of their riding capabilities, their continued stamina and interest in riding. And uh, one of them is uh, George Oldershaw, who I rode to Alaska with last year on a 9,700-mile trip. George and I and a couple of other people rode up to the uh, Arctic Circle. And I can't remember how old George is, but he's in his mid-80s someplace, I think. And um, he's awfully difficult to keep up with. And we rode a gnarly 250-mile round trip, uh, excuse me, 400-mile round trip in gravel to get to the Arctic Circle. And um, as much as I tried, I was constantly behind him. And uh, the other hero of mine uh, is uh, Nobby Robertson. And uh, Nobby is just one heck of a dirt rider. And he's been out there plowing through the dirt for so many years. He knows every inch of every trail up around, uh, uh, up in the mountains there where we uh, do a lot of dirt riding. 
And he's another guy that is not only hard to keep up with, for me it's impossible to keep up with him. And uh, I hope when I'm Nobby's age I'm still bumping along on trails and, uh, and pavement as well. And I think that's about all I uh, have to say about my experience in the club. Uh, as I said before, it's been a savior for me. I love uh, all of my brothers and sisters who are members of the club. It's been a great pleasure to be affiliated with each and every one of them. It's a magnificent uh, organization with a wonderful group of people, and we should cherish uh, our opportunity that we have in uh, being a member. Thank you very much. Hi, Club. My name is Lindsay Mickles. I've been a member of the club for about six years. I want to say because I'm following the geese and he talked about age a little bit, uh, I'm 47 years old. I look older than that in part, uh, well, for two reasons. I'm wearing this face because nobody could get it to smile, so I volunteered to wear it for a while. And then I added the beard because I thought it would tend to keep the ladies away. Actually, uh, it's worked a little bit better than I had anticipated, and so it's probably coming off quite soon. By way of introduction, let me mention how I came to be a member of the club. One of your more prominent members, John Harrison, has been a member, I guess, maybe eight or nine years now, and I have ridden with him in Europe since about 1981. And uh, one day he said, well, why don't you come on a ride with us? And uh, I, I think it was a small club ride and then failing that no excuse me it was him and Ralph Sherrock we went to a couple of places together and then he said you know my club's going down to Cabo San Lucas wherever that was why don't you come along so I thought it sounded like fun on the way down there obviously I didn't know anybody at all really in the club other than John I, uh, I think I might have been introduced to one or two members on the way down there John got a flat tire and uh, he and I stayed behind. We were riding with, a, it was John Harrison and Bob Schmidt and I riding as a trio. John's tire went flat outside, 12 miles outside of La Paz. And uh, Bob Schmidt, excuse me, Bob Schmidt went on ahead to La Paz, to, uh, let, let's break for a sec. Bob Schmidt, John Harrison, and I were on our way to Cabo San Lucas with the club, and uh, John Harrison got a flat tire outside of La Paz, about 12 miles out of La Paz. So we sent Bob Schmidt on ahead to Cabo San Lucas, and John and I followed about five hours later after we had repaired his tire in La Paz. Well. Recall that I knew very few members of the club, if any, other than Ralph Chirac. And upon our pulling up in front of the hotel in uh, Cabo San Lucas, everybody from the club came out to greet us as though we were long-lost buddies. I was so impressed because maybe five or six people came up to me and they patted me on the back and they hugged me and thought I'd come across the Arabian Desert. And they helped me with my saddlebags, helped me unload the motorcycle, and at that point, I decided, by God, a group of people like this is the right group to travel with. And I've been a member pretty much ever since. Now, a couple of little stories that I brought along in my head to uh, share with you. The first one is a story about how it is that we are the only 100-year-old club that has a picture of a pit bull mutt up on the uh, club wall presently on the uh, eastern wall of the club, directly above the water fountain and the coffee machine. Uh, no, excuse me, not the coffee machine, but the, uh, the popcorn machine. Uh, in the late 90s, I had some business that took me north of Santa Rosa, and I had to do some business with a guy who ran a disreputable junkyard. In the disreputable junkyard was a little dog that had been obviously mistreated, not fed well, and was filthy and not well taken care of. And the little, do the little dog, I think, saw a sucker as soon as one came upon the scene, and I was that guy. I wound up taking this mix, this pit bull mix home, 
named him Jameson because I thought he needed a little class, and that was the classiest whiskey that I knew of. And um, some years later, when I joined the club, at that point, Jameson was about nine or ten years old, I began bringing him to meetings, meetings in part because uh, I needed the company on the trip down. I lived quite a ways away, and in part also to further socialize him. Well, it so happened that he and Tracy Snyder fell in love. And whenever I came to the club, he would make a beeline for Tracy and usually sit alongside of her through the meetings if I'd let him. And I left him in her current care whenever I had to exit the club for one reason or another. And so three years after that, Jameson, as dogs will, up and died from excessive arthritis in the rear end. I finally had to put him down. Shortly before his death, I had a portrait made of him. I had copies made of the portrait, and I presented one to Tracy Snyder. Well, as I gave it to Tracy, several of the club members who were present noticed it, and the next thing you know, somebody made a motion before the club that the club appropriate the portrait of Jameson, who had come to so many meetings, and that they put it up on the wall. The motion passed unanimously, and that's how it is that we are the only hundred-year-old club with a picture of a Mongol pit bull prominently displayed on the club wall. So much for the portrait. The second uh, little tale I wanted to tell Harrison and probably uh, Mark Norris could tell it bigger, better than I, but I'll give you my version. Two years ago, we were coming down into uh, La Paz, uh, excuse me, into, uh, actually we're headed for Cabo San Lucas again, and we were about halfway on our trip, and as many of you know who've been through Mexico, at every county line in Mexico, there is a little army checkpoint manned by adolescents with repeating uh, weapons. And as you approach, what you see typically is a sandbagged machine gun post on the right. And on the left, a little teenage kid in an army uniform runs out uh, bearing a submachine gun about the size of, uh, about his size. He runs out waving a wigwag, which commands you to stop. Well, we had become fairly used to this, and they stop us and ask us if we have guns or narcotics, and we say no, and normally they allow us then to pass on. As we approached one of these stops, John and I were bringing up the rear. John Harrison and I, we were going along fairly slowly. Everybody had passed us, and all of a sudden, um, John Balzar, who goes by the name within the club of Uncle John. He's an old rider, an old racer. He'd helped for a, quite a long time building the club itself, and he goes on several of our rides, lives down around Hollister, at least he used to. And he came tearing by John and I at speeds that appeared to be at least 100 miles an hour. Well, we surmised as he went by that he was going to catch up with Mark, or trying to. Just about then, we came upon the Mexican stopping uh, checkpoint, and ahead, we saw a huge cloud of dust. What had happened was that Uncle John had hit his front brake, and I suppose rear as well, to slow down. Allegedly, the ABS didn't work. He, uh, he washed out his front end and went down probably at close to 100 miles an hour. Well, he was airborne about 18 inches above the ground on his back, looking up at the sun, and he went through the Mexican checkpoint 18 inches above the ground. Then when he hit the ground, he shedded his entire uniform. His bike sped up past him and struck Mark Norris's right saddlebag, Mark's right Jesse bag, uh, struck it hard enough to dent it and knock it off the motorcycle. So when John and I recovered our power of uh, thought and sight, what we saw was Mark Norris spinning around, trying to control his motorcycle, while his bag had spun off to the right, and there was a huge cloud where either Uncle John or his bike or both had joined one another on the desert to the side of the road. Well, we ran over, and inside of about 45 minutes, 
uh, various of us contributed uh, glasses of oil and and tape and wire and we got uh, we got Uncle John's belongings distributed to the Mexican border guards and we got most of his motorcycle back working again and he completed the trip. But I must say that the specter of seeing Uncle John flying through the checkpoint 18 inches above the ground on his back, that is inverted in a sense, was one of my uh, most memorable uh, thoughts of those frequent Cabo trips that we do, one every every year from January. Let's see what else. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, oh, in summation, let me add to something that Geezer said. Like John Rahowitz, I have been a member of quite a few what sociologists call outgroups. That is a law enforcement group, uh, an attorney's bar group, uh, ski club, and sailing club. And uh, I must say that I think that the uh, I think that the motorcyclists that I have traveled with, particularly in the Oakland group here, have been the uh, happiest, most generous, friendliest, and most enjoyable people with whom I've had the chance to uh, interface and they are a continuing source of delight, inspiration and fun for me and I hope to continue that. Actually at uh, 47 years old I have a good many years where I can still enjoy the club and I'm quite looking forward to that. Thank you very much. In exiting let me add a postscript to the Uncle John and the 18 inch uh, levitation story we ran over to where Uncle John had landed, and of course his entire outfit looked as though he'd been in a cement mixer for about a month and a half. And uh, we expected to see a mountain of blood, gore, brain matter, and instead Uncle John leaped into the air and he yelled, Yippee! He said, that's the easiest get off I've ever had in my whole life from a crash. And he was absolutely beside himself with joy because obviously he wasn't hurt and he was ready to continue on to Cabo as soon as we got his motorcycle back together and on to Cabo we went and had a marvelous time as usual so that's the Uncle John levitation story well I'm Miles Goodman and I've been a member of the Oakland Motorcycle Club for a little more than a year um, I believe it was May when uh, I finally had my final uh, reading and the vote on, on me, and they voted me in, uh, surprisingly. I, I was uh, originally introduced to the Oakland Motorcycle Club when I went on my first three bridge run, and that was about, uh, I think that was in 2001. Um, and after that, uh, after that run, um, I went back with the uh, club that I was riding with and uh, just forgot about Oakland, but it was always on the back of my mind, just kind of forgot about it. Um, a couple of years ago, I uh, started a job for a short while in Los Angeles, and everybody that I was riding with um, wasn't riding anymore. They went their separate ways, so I said, oh, I'm going to go back to the Oakland Motorcycle Club, and that was in January of uh, 2006. And um, I started coming to the meetings and uh, was voted in in, in, in May. Um, let's see, I was sponsored by uh, Paul Gregerson and uh, Larry Stewart. And um, I really enjoy uh, everybody in the club. It, the camaraderie is, is, is really good. Um, the trips that we go on, uh, I, I usually have a good time. I mean, there are ups and downs, uh, but I have a good time. Um, we just finished our 100-year anniversary uh, cruise, which I thought, I thought was great. I, I love the Caribbean, and uh, uh, my wife and I had a, a very good time. Um, and then again, the th we worked the Three Bridge Run, run this year, and um, that, that did very well. I thought it, it was pretty good. Um, the hamburgers are great because I didn't have to cook them. Um, but I, I had an easy job. I think it was an easy job. I was uh, administrative, um, walking around and, and, and doing um, uh, crazy things, I guess. I, I don't know, just helping everybody out. Um, oh, but I forgot, but um, last uh, February, 
I was elected sergeant at arms, so uh, I've been doing that. That's kind of a good job because you uh, get to meet everybody new and get to meet everybody old. And uh, before you know it, everybody knows your name, and you know everybody else's name. So uh, I kind of enjoyed that. I, I like meeting all the new people, and they get kind of surprised when they see this big white-haired guy uh, get up and say, "What's your name? You know, where are you from? Uh, who's your who's your your get who's your sponsor or who you were guest of?" So um, I, I'm really not mean, but I try to be as nice as I possibly can to keep them coming back. But one of the things that, that I'd, I'd like to mention is uh, some of the people that I met. Paul Gregerson, uh, I was like his best friend when I came, in, when I came into the club. Always sit, sat near him. Uh, he like, took me under his, his wing, and um, he has no idea how much uh, I appreciate that. And then we finally got this nickname called the Evil Twins. Uh, we're not evil. Uh, we're not even twins, but because we're tall and gray hair, they call us the Evil Twins. So <laughs> that's kind of, that, was, that was kind of funny, and we're still friends to this day. Uh, I like his company. He's a great guy. Um, I met Doc Marvin. Doc Marvin and I uh, ride together quite frequently. Um, I know he has a crazy schedule. Uh, mine is more sedate um, because doctor's schedules are, are just insane. Me, I'm an electrical estimator. I sit there with numbers all day long, fool around with a computer, uh, put pricing together, uh, design power into a building, and that's it. I'm done. I go home at 5 o'clock. Uh, Doc doesn't. Uh, so we get, whenever we get a chance, we'll have a Starbucks together or we'll take a ride together um, and have a good time. And some of the rides are, are really good. Uh, I especially like the Lake Topaz ride. And Elaine, uh, everybody met my wife Elaine, um, the, the Topaz ride is really, really good, um, going through the Sierras and then coming down into Lo Lake Topaz. Just before we come down into Lake Topaz, uh, there's this um, area in, in the mountains, I don't know, the open moon or the big moon or, or something like that. You just come around a turn and, and all of a sudden you're in awe of this, just this beautiful place. Um, I, I don't know what it's called, but it's beautiful, and it's just before Lo Lake Topaz. And uh, I enjoyed that, the dinner there, and um, the, the party out on the grass, and um, the, the gambling at night. And, uh, we had have a, have a good time. Um, this year we didn't get to Lake Topaz because half the place burned down and it wasn't ready for us um, by the time we were ready to leave. So we went to Carson City, which was just as nice, but it wasn't Lake Topaz. Um, but we had a good time, a good time anyway. Um, I don't know about any other uh, rides that I can think of. The Stag Ride. The Stag Ride last year was really funny. Some of the guys did some funny things. I'm not going to rat on them. I'm not going to tell what they did. But they, they, they did some stuff that uh, is unmentionable. Uh, <laughs> that, was a fun, that was a fun ride uh, also. Oh, and this year, I don't know, should I, can, can I mention that I played this um, uh, special character around Christmas time that runs around in a red suit. Um, I never in a million years thought that I would uh, play that part and be that, that guy with the red nose and the red suit and the white hair. But um, the pictures came out great. I thought, it, I, thought I looked great. <laughs> I never thought I'd be a good Santa Claus. Uh, even Bungie's laughing at that. <laughs> I'd, I'll do it again this year. That was a lot of fun for me. Um, the kids had a great time, and then afterwards they were saying, I know who you are. I know who you are. You know, they thought they knew I was Santa Claus, but I don't think so. But um, that, that, that was good. That was good. And we'll see what comes up in the, in the next few years. Next few years. Let's see, I'm 57. I should be in the club until I'm about 90. Um, uh, everybody else seems to last that long. I hope I do, too. Um, You know, the club has been around a uh, hundred years, um, and I, I really hope that it, it's around another 100 years. Uh, we seem to get, uh, be getting a lot of new, younger members, younger than me. I don't consider myself old, but younger than me. So I expect the club to be around. I just hope I'm, um, I'm around maybe to see the next uh, 50th, 150 year anniversary. Maybe I'll be lucky enough to, uh, to get that. But then I would be over 100. But uh, who knows? I might be around for that.
Tom Crone with the OMC. Joined the club in 1990. Probably one of the few people who had their second reading at the uh, hot dog feed, which was a pretty big tradition with the club each summer. And uh, just wanted to uh, give my rendition of the last 17 years of being around the Oakland Motorcycle Club. So uh, maybe I could come back to this in a little bit. <laughs> Great. Yeah, like I was saying, joined in uh, 1990 and anybody who was in the club about that time or in that time, you looked at people like the Ray Vals and the Mark Norrises, the Buzz Dares, the Mike Duncans, George Mattis, Ben Zeppa, you know, Don Demers. All these people were like, as much as father figures, they were like almost untouchable figures. It's kind of interesting. You know, you'd sit there and go, wow, these guys don't have a lot to say to you. They don't say much. But the coolest part was as you, as, as you became part of the family of the club. They warmed up more and more and knew you were serious about joining it. They got to know your kids. They got to know your wife. It was an incredible time. When I first joined, my youngest daughter uh, was just two. And we'd go on club outings and not poker runs, a little young for that, but we'd go on club outings and campouts. And Sabrina would ride with my wife, Jackie, in a doom buggy and she'd have her little bonnet on and she was ready to take on the world. Samantha would ride with me the time I had a 1200 goal wing. It was just awesome times. We had camp outs from every place from Kings Canyon. We went, spent a Thanksgiving with the club down in San Diego. We did uh, one of the older members, Hugh McCusker. We did a camp out up at his place. It was the greatest time. You'd run into people like Charlie Bellman, you know, run into Hugh McCusker, who's a character into himself. And Charlie Bellman, I can remember the, probably one of the best campouts is Charlie Bellman pitches a tent in the only level place we got up near uh, McQuick's place. Happy for the night, all bedded down, flat, nice level, the rains come in. By the morning, and when I mean morning, four or five in the morning, Charlie Bellman's tents barely ready to float away. So the only level spot had turned into McQuick's pond. It had filled up so full. And I think had we not woke Charlie up, he probably would have drowned right there that night. <laughs> it was some great times. We had Lee Sherman, the old timers, the old codgers, I have to say, you know, and the guys would just, be as relaxed and as easy going, welcoming the kids and everything, and it was some good times to be had, I gotta tell you. Great. I tell you, I think one of the best parts of the club, and I've been kind of a loner a lot of my life, and done a lot of things by myself, but joining the club, not only do we enjoy the pleasures of street riding and all the rest of it, but the dirt riding especially has been a real kick. When I first started riding, probably when I was back 17, 18, uh, it was dirt almost exclusively. And then opportunity came up, I'm thinking four or five, maybe six years ago already, we all went down to Batapilas. We trailered Mark Norris, ton of people, Mike Vetter, about 12, 13 of us, the Smiths, Dan Smith, Billy Smith. We all trailered the bikes down to Douglas, Arizona, where you could talk for hours on the arrangements made, but the trailers were kept, the trucks were kept there by a grand old couple. Entering the country was stories you could talk forever on. But I gotta tell you, for 12 days nonstop, there was nothing but a smile on my face and everybody else's face. We had police escorts through Madeira to get to hotels and motels. We had tequila flowing like water. We had beer. 
spent some time in Creel, watched Mike Vetter try and put the charm on a couple of Japanese gals who drank him literally under the table. Was wonderful. And the trip down through the dirt to Batapilas, down if anybody doesn't know, is the Grand Canyon of Mexico. The trip was like taking a mule trail down the side. We had everything from crankcases being cracked to oil pans being holes punched in them. And the best part about the club is there's people like, you can go on, Mark Norris and Dan Smith, who just take all the events of the day easy going, say, well, we can patch this up, we'll borrow a little oil from here. The day went on, people got sick, we swam in the river, we got our act together, we got the bikes all going, we ended up down in Batapilas, had a great meal, drank tequila, and it was a great time. And I tell you, probably of all the things that I've done, that was probably the most exquisite trip I took with the club. Great. And just to close up, I'd, what, all I'd like to do is really just kind of say a special thanks to a lot of the members that have gone since uh, I've been in the club and have made the club even that much more special to me. But we certainly have lost Art Sullivan and Howard Self. We lost Don Turk, who anybody who never got the thrill of listening to a story from Don Turk has missed a piece of life. Charlie Bellman, I uh, saw Charlie probably the day before he died, and he still talked to me about being a submariner and wanting like crazy to go through the Panama Canal. George Bacon and the stories you could tell with George Bacon would make your stomach laugh. Jerry Reynolds was a wonderful member and passed early on when I was in the club and was great to ride with. As a matter of fact, uh, when we rode the 1,000 miles in 24 hours, Jerry Reynolds was uh, tailgating us the whole time, just saying he'd ride for another 100 miles, ride for another 100, and by the time we ended up finishing the ride, Jerry had already ridden 500 miles before we started on our 1,000. So he come back gloating like a stuck pig, flashing out his 1,500 miles, and. 36 hours, non-stop riding, crazy guy. Rob Stevens, who'd come up from L.A. sometimes for a Wednesday night meeting, have the meeting and head back to L.A. and drive a truck the next day. Spoiled my kids with some chocolates down on that San Diego thing we were talking about. And then, God bless him, Lee Sherman, probably the best smoker in the club. We'd ride together, tail gun and sweeper and then Lee would see me starting to shake a little as we're going down the road, and he'd pop in his cigarette lighter and light up a cigarette and hand it over to me, and I was good for another 50 miles. <laughs> and that was great. And that's all I got to say. <laughs> okay, my name is Willard Spinks, and I joined the club, I think, in 53. Put me being there 90 years, 90 years. I mean, I'm only that old, but I've been in the club since for uh, 53 years. I oh, don't be more than that. About uh, 58 years, I guess. And I joined the club because it's, to me, more of a family affair uh, rather than just belonging to a club. I mean, it is, to me, it is, I knew I had got a lot of friends in that club. And uh, I, uh, I, I can't think of, since I had my stroke, I had a little trouble when, well, <laughs> thinking what I'm going to say. But, uh, okay, when I first joined the club, they, they they had quite a few different rides. Uh, one was a snow run ride, and the, I uh, to show you how much cheaper things were then. I 
I uh, paid 75 cents for a bed to sleep in at Snowland. <laughs> and we slept in the basement with a mattress, and my, I used my own sleeping bag. And uh, they, I got to say, Oh, and I woke up in the morning, there was six inches of water on the floor. So I had to go from bed to bed <laughs> to, get, to get it rid of it. You remember that, Mark? No. Uh, I was, that was after me, or before me. Oh, you mean, you're that young? <laughs> 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 anyway, another run that I used to like to go on is they uh, call it... Uh, I don't know what they call it, but it, we went to Willows. And uh, it was a run that was a kind of a illegal ride. We all raced each other. And uh, I, I'm, if you don't mind me mentioning Howard Tell, but uh, he was a uh, he worked on motorcycles all the time, the police motorcycles, he owned a motorcycle shop. So we were ra racing up by Willis up there, and up there at 100 miles an hour, and a cop pulled uh, all of us over and was, was going to write us a ticket. But Howard drove up and said, Hi there, Bill. Hi, George, to the policeman. And, we all, okay, we'll see you later. We all rolled on. So, uh, things like that. And I, I, I was in those races a little bit, but I don't think I could keep up with some of those guys. They'd work a long time fixing their bikes so they could go fast. And uh, the... Yeah. I'm Mark Norris, and I wanted to jump in here and ask Willard a few questions that uh, would he could remember uh, some of the things that we used to do in the past. And uh, one of the things I'd like to ask him is, uh, Willard, do you remember uh, when out at the ranch at the uh, pipeline? Yeah. When we put in the pipeline? Yeah, but I remember that good. Yeah, well, I'm going to tell a little story about Willard for that. Uh, we put on a, Willard needed a pipeline to go across the ranch on a... a uh, water line and it was going to be put in steel line. It was half an inch and a half uh, water pipe and uh, we ran it all the way across and Willard made up a little uh, uh, walker to go out on the uh, line and do some work and and the thing worked really good. He got way out there and all of a sudden that thing let loose and he dropped about I'd say about 11 feet and uh, but it was cu it was hooked over the top and it caught him and was able to pull him back up. Remember that one, Willard? Yep. Yep. <laughs> uh, let's see. And then uh, some of the times that we used to ride to the ranch late at night and go, go leave about noon here and go to the ranch and get up there. Remember those days? Yep. You want to tell? Yeah, the ranch was a place that we used to go to. Willard has uh, 40 acres up on the Klamath River above uh, Willow Creek, and uh, you go up, uh, what was the highway? 90 96. 96. Right? Out of Willow Creek, and you go up uh, to Soames Bar, and seven miles past Soames Bar, he had a beautiful place up there that we used to go up and spend some time up, and we'd do a lot of dual sport riding up there, and riding up and back on our street bikes, and we just had a good time, and I just wanted to re relate to the, some of the stuff that we used to do up there. I think Willard had a time, and I'd like him to tell a story, which I don't know about, but he did hit, run into a bear on a, one of the trips up there. Yeah, I was traveling back in, through Willow, Weaverville, and uh, 12 o'clock at night. And all of a sudden the bear is come running full speed right across the highway, and uh, I'm thinking how close I was to getting killed or something. You have to name it in a hundredth of a second. It, he took his nose and hit my crash bars 
and he probably spun around a lot and uh, didn't throw me off. But if I'd have hit him dead on, I uh, probably wouldn't be here to tell you about it. <laughs> so, uh, what kind of bike was you riding? Uh, Indian. Yeah. I bought a 70, 47 Indian, I think it was. And uh, I was, it's a heavy bike, so it, it, you never know how to feel. The, uh, right in there, and when it hit the bear, it didn't throw me. It just stopped me. Not dead, but you know, I was, say I was going 70, probably hit me and I was going 45. As soon as I hit him, he just stopped me like that. So that is a few close calls I had in, in my day. <laughs> but it was. Just it's not uh, going yet. Like. Uh, mind you, it was like Mark here and a few of the other guys. We bought a school bus, and we, we made a trailer that held 20 motorcycles. And uh, we loaded the motorcycles on this thing and roared up there, and we had the kids. Tracy was one of them, I guess. They slept in the back of the bus. Well, we kind of had parties all the way up, I guess you'd say. And we had a, quite a good time with that bus. So uh, Mark can tell you more about what yeah, I broke, can... broke down at once. And, uh, we had a pretty good mechanic with this, Dirk. He had to change the uh, valve sprocket or something right on the side of the road there. And we got it made. Kept going. So, who was involved in the bus was uh, Dirk and Wilna, Dan and Doty, uh, 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 Ken and uh, Janet and uh, Phil and uh, Joyce, uh, which was uh, Will uh, Willard's Joyce was Willard's daughter and his son-in-law, and Ken Harless is Willard's uh, son, and uh, and then myself and Linda, and then the kids, and we had. Uh, Joyce's kids, which was Willard's grandkids, uh, they would always ride in the back of the bus. Uh, we made it up so they had a little place, and we took the last seat out and laid a, pl uh, a mattress back there, and they could uh, ride up in the back of the bus. And we took all our, our dual sports. That that was in the 70s, about 1975, and there wasn't a lot of dual sport bikes out then. And uh, we ha w would go out there and uh, do dual sport riding. It was really uh, quite a, quite interesting. Uh, Willard, can you name some of the motorcycles that you had in the past? Well, I, I've, had, I've ridden BMWs since '56, and uh, that is the main bike that I rode. In, in between a few Hondas, smaller bikes like dirt bikes and stuff like that. But the last bike I had was a dirt BMW. I still got it, hoping to get well here. <laughs> I can ride it again, but that's that's about many bikes I own. And then we did the Colorado trip. Yeah, well, one trip I can't remember whether you can remember or not. We used to go to Indio. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I didn't know whether you was going those those days or not. Yeah. We went to Indio and we slept on uh, camel manure. Remember, the camels were there in the barn before us, and we laid out our sleeping bags and uh, well, we uh, slept on top of the camel manure. They said. Well, that one little joke about that. Talking about Don Turk, he was always the unlucky one when it comes to something like that, and he was passing a horse trailer, and the way he put it, the horse horse got diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> and got it all over him, and he, had, he stayed getting washed. But he was just the type of a guy that all of us had troubles, <laughs> like little, like that. It's funny, you know. So uh, you remember him saying yeah. that? Hey, we all, everybody got up and talked about their trip down, you know, and he got up and talked about it. There was another trip that you made to Mexico with Don. Yeah. You and Vernell and uh, Dan and Doty 
and Ken and Janet and Don and uh, I don't know who he was. Oh, and Jerry. Yeah. And you remember, I, I, I didn't go on that trip, but I remember the toilets and the motel and, he, and Don's room overflowed, and you really had a problem. Remember those at that yeah. time? Yeah. Yeah. He, he was always kind of unlucky when <laughs> things like that would happen to him. Right. But he'd enjoy it, joke about it, so. And then uh, when you, you, you tell us a little bit about your horseshoe, your horseshoe uh, times, uh, when you were throwing horseshoes, were well, right? Yeah, well, I, I've always enjoyed playing horseshoes, so uh, I got into a lot of the games around here, these small games, and uh, turn them out of fact, one in Stockton, I guess, this shirt came from right here. And... Uh, I I got to play. Uh, uh, there was a guy called Walter Ray Williams, and he was the world champion uh, for quite a few years. Even when he was a kid, he was a junior world champion. Anyway, one day they got uh, they had we had eight people had to play at once. So they didn't have a, the eighth one at all, so they asked me if I would play with the experts. Walter A. William was a world tournament. So I said, well, sure. I mean, I know I couldn't beat them, but <laughs> at least I was up high enough that I would play with them. So, and, and like I said, Walter Ray Williams could have been off that day and I could have beat him. <laughs> I had that to think about. So. I uh, got to play a few things like that. And one thing, I could talk about a boat we had. And this boat was made by the Indians without tools. They, they weighed, they'd burn, burn it and scrape. And uh, we crossed the river since 1910. You know, and uh, did you ever ride in it? I did one time. Yeah. Uh, let me just say that, that uh, Will is talking about a uh, a boat that uh, he used to go to his home in. Uh, in the past, when I used, went up there, they'd put in two bridges. They were just putting them in then. But before that, the road was on the other side, and they had to take a boat over to, to the ranch. And that's the boat that he's talking about. Yeah. So I got, it's over in San Francisco now, in a museum. I gave it to him for a, I had a hard time getting them to, the they, uh, funny thing, we were up there and they drove in with a small truck and I said, well, how come you're, you're going to haul this boat and that thing? And he said, oh yeah, we're going to do that. So <laughs> I, uh, I always call these guys, I guess I got like a nickname to them, <laughs> City Ginks. <laughs> but, <laughs> They were going to pull the old wagon out with the boat sitting on a wagon, and they were pulling it out, and the rope broke. And the whole bunch of them <laughs> fell on the ground because we couldn't laugh too loud, but we laughed. <laughs> okay, uh, I just want to uh, tell us, I just want to talk a little bit about Willard and some of the writing that I've done. I did a lot of writing with Willard in the 70s. And uh, Willard is a very good writer. There's a lot of people that are racers and stuff, and they go out and write. But Willard was a very smooth writer. He, uh, I used to write a, a, a two-stroke, and I would be, when we'd pass cars, he'd go around the car, and I'd have to wait until he got all the way around the car because I'd have to go around real fast. But uh, he, Willard could just pull away. He was very smooth, knew how to use his brakes. He was a very, very good street writer. I just had to say that, Willard. He did a lot of riding up and down those hills. Yeah. Yeah. And let's see, uh, there's other things that uh, we've done. And uh, uh, we did dirt riding. We went over to Carnegie. We used to go to Carnegie sometimes and ride in the dirt. With, uh, when Jerry had uh, the, uh, uh, Jerry Taylor used to have feeds over there at Carnegie. Be that was even before it was a Carnegie. It was called Site 300. It was a free. You'd just go over there and ride. Remember we'd go over there and do that? Yeah. And uh, Jerry would have uh, feeds over there. 
and uh, let's see what else uh, there was so many things that there, uh, you was in the club way before I was so uh, I know you've done a lot of things uh, that uh, I'm not sure before but uh, well that's why I've enjoyed the club because it is more family you was like you was in a family not a club so that's why I stuck it out quite a few years and I think I was I got perfect attendance down there I think I don't think anybody's gonna ever beat me but maybe some of the younger <laughs> younger was but if you go every every week you get two weeks off if you're on a vacation but riding a bike so I was I made a lot of a lot of I would have still probably been doing it every year, but I, I joined the police auxiliary. And there's a funny thing about that. Uh, it should be about the end of it anyway. The, should, uh, the, the policeman that is teaching us how to shoot, we had a, our gun in a holster, and he said, okay, back up 50 feet and dra pull your gun out and fire. Now see where you hit. There wasn't a single one that hit the, mark, hit the statue there, except me and I just grazed the top of his head. That <laughs> uh, was one of the <laughs> good, funny things. That, they hear him say, now look where you hit. And nobody hit the, hit the Skeleton or whatever they call it, it's a man size dummy or whatever you want to call it. So, but anyway, I spent a few years in that. Few, not years, I think, I don't know how long. I guess I'm still a auxiliary policeman, but it's been quite a while ago. Okay, I can't think of anything else to say, can you? I think that's about it. Yeah. Okay, Willard, uh, we're uh, in our 100th anniversary year right now, 1907. We're celebrating it all year. And uh, how old are you? I just turned 70 about three months ago. 70? Uh, excuse me. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thought you looked a little old for 70. <laughs> I, uh, I make that mistake. I'm a little young for 70. I make that mistake with 70 and 90 for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah. But I'm 90. So, 90 years old. 90 years old, yeah. yeah. we had a pretty good party at the club, too. Yeah, we had a 90 year old party. You're following right up with the club. Yeah, I was telling the merchant, oh, where would he go? Uh -huh. uh, I got it, and I told him, too, both. They held a 1960 or 70. No, wait a minute. 90. 90 on a wall, you know, that I was 90 years old. Well, I just took it off the wall and told Mark, I'll save it for him so when he hits 90. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, are you going to be around for the uh, two, when, we, when the club turns 200? Well, uh, I will. Uh, when, will you be 90 by then? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I'll be 90 by then. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Morris, I joined the club and... <clears throat> March of 1963, I was 28 years old. And uh, the rope way I joined the club was through Ray Val. And uh, I had bought a BSA just about a year before I joined the club to do any serious motorcycle riding. And uh, I'd met Ray and his uh, he had a father-in-law, and he had a BSA, and Ray had a matchless. And we was, uh, we'd go up and... Uh, we said we was going to go up in the Sierras and go fishing. Well, we went up, we did this twice, and our fishing poles never came off of the bike. We finally realized that it, this was not what we was really intended on doing. It was motorcycling that we really needed to do, and we always, probably in the back of our head, was using the fishing as an excuse. So anyhow, Ray was always talking about the club, and 
he had joined the club and he always said, well, why don't you come down and visit it? So I went down a few times and he said, well, you know, you should join. And I says, yeah, I says, I'll, I'll join and I'll just sort of be a part time. I'll come down once in a while. Well, I joined and now it's uh, 40 some years later and you get involved and uh, it's a social club. It's a really a family. You join it. You become part of a family in the motorcycle uh, family. But we ride. We do very serious riders in this club. And one of the things I wanted to talk about is some of the people that, when I joined, uh, who was in the club, and uh, some of the memories that I had early, early on. And uh, when, when I joined, we was meeting in a club hall down on uh, San Pablo and 30th, uh, across the street from the California Hotel. And we was upstairs. And we'd been there, uh, we was there for 40 years. But anyhow, uh, when I joined, there was people like Lefty Ben, which was really named Walter Hutzler, which I didn't find out his, uh, n n it was his nickname until uh, quite a few years later. Uh, I always knew him as Lefty Ben, and then finally I found out his name was Walter Hutzler. He wasn't even left-handed. And then we had uh, 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 Ray Winters. He was our bartender, and he didn't even ride a motorcycle. But he was uh, uh, our bartender for many years, and uh, he was a piano mover. He had a big piano uh, moving truck, and sometimes on runs he'd take that with us. Uh, for instance, on a sheet iron run, he took the uh, truck up to the top of the mountain. It was one of the years that we was able to get to the top of the mountain. And uh, when we got up there, he opened up his truck, and he had all these hors d'oeuvres and beer and salami and sandwich. We made sandwiches, and it was really a good time. And Quite a few, some of the bikes went into the truck on the way home. And in those days, we didn't uh, really realize uh, how to wear gear. That's one of the things that you learn. Uh, it's a lot easier to learn that now, but uh, uh, we used to put leather jackets on and maybe a T-shirt and get cold at night. Man, I'll tell you, you really froze. You didn't have much of a windshield. But we learned to wear la layered clothes, and the gear that's out now is uh, much better. Um, uh, some of the other people in the club was uh, 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 Howard Self, my, uh, which became my father-in-law and one of the greatest guys that I, I, in the club. And uh, uh, let me think. One of the other people that's in the club was in the club was uh, Al Drain. Al Drain, he was uh, really a great member. We used to call him the Fang, and he was part a parts a member, uh, parts man, at uh, Nelson Brothers for quite a few years, and he'd worked at uh, several different shops. He was a Suzuki parts manager over at uh, uh, the Suzuki Kawasaki in uh, in Alameda, and uh, his son uh, actually belonged to our club. Harry Drain was uh, into the club. His wife Goldie Drain was uh, the aux an auxiliary member, and. Uh, they was, uh, uh, it <laughs> Ralph Davis is another fella that was in the club. Actually, he's a life member, and he should be down to our, our uh, 100th anniversary party. But I'd like to say a few things about him. And he used to have a, uh, a party. He lived in Castro Valley, and he would uh, have a party, invite the whole club over. And the party started like in that four o'clock in the afternoon, and it would end at like nine o'clock the next morning or ten. Have breakfast, but it went all night. It was really uh, something, and the, they really those people really knew how to party. And then they went. They moved up to a Forest Hill. Uh, his wife was. Uh, at, uh, um, they moved up to Forest Hill, and they would throw parties up there. They had a pool up there, and we would go up and camp out at their uh, place. And uh, it was really a good time. Uh, and her, his her his son Pete Davis is uh, was in the club. There are a lot of people in the club that had uh, a father and son team in the club. Lots of lots of that. And uh, they uh, Pete Davis has uh, did some uh, in the last year has done some uh, speed uh, speed at Bonneville has a couple of records at Bonneville did really well. Uh, Ray Val was a fellow that brought me into the club. And uh, we used to ride together a lot and had a good old time. And then uh, later on, uh, as time went on, I rode with Willard a lot. We did uh, many, many rides together. 
Uh, we went to Colorado. We went to uh, um, New Mexico. We did the Four Corners. Another trip, we went to Yellowstone. And then uh, many trips to the ranch. Um, and uh, I never went to Mexico with them, but they, they did the Mexico thing. And then uh, later on, I rode with uh, 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 Don Demers. Don Demers was uh, one of the big uh, guys in our club, and he was the one that uh, had a lot of input on our, n our new club, putting together the club. I'd like to give him credit for that. The club members uh, put the thing together, but he was the guy that really made sure that it got done. And... Uh, and then I rode with uh, John Harrison. I did a lot of riding with John. In the last years, I've done riding with John Harrison. We did the, a lot of long runs. John Harrison, I used to think, in the last, uh, since I retired, I've done six years of riding. Went to uh, Labrador, <coughs> went to uh, Alaska uh, twice, and to the, up to into the Northwest Territory once, and did uh, 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 the Demp Dempster Highway, which is a 400 mile road. Uh, it's all dirt. You leave Dawson. It actually, it's 500 miles, and there's one stop in the middle, uh, Fort McPherson, that you stay overnight and get gas and go on the next day. It's like riding from here to L.A. on a dirt road with one stop in the middle. Uh, and uh, then uh, I've done a lot of riding in Mexico. Uh, start started uh, uh, about, uh, I think we've done 11 years, and the first year we wanted to go to Mexico, uh, there was three of us, uh, John, John Whites and myself and uh, uh, Ralph Chirac, and we didn't know how to do it, so we went to Chris because he had uh, some expertise uh, going down there on the turtle truck, and he rode with a uh, 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 city bike uh, down there once. So uh, we got a hold of him and asked him if he would uh, sort of give us a little hint of how to get down there. and. So we did, and uh, so the four, uh, I think we had, uh, oh, and Lee Sherman was with us on that trip, the first trip. And we stumbled and fall, fell, and we got through it. And now, 11 years later, we're, we know pretty well all of the twists and turns and places to stay, and it's really been a nice ride. Mexico is a very good place to ride in. The road uh, in the Baja from uh, Tijuana down to uh, Cabo San Lucas is uh, one of the nicest roads uh, to, for a, a street bike to go on. And uh, also they have uh, dirt, dirt riding. I'd like to say a little bit about our sister club. We've uh, been uh, with our sister club for uh, about 27 years, might even be more than that, but we've, uh, the Greater Vancouver Motorcycle Club, uh, we became uh, 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 together with them and we've uh, re it's really opened up riding to us. They, uh, they uh, have a lot of uh, their events. The club is just like ours. They, they started in 1927 and it's, it's really ironic how close, uh, even before we met them, how close our clubs were together. They were, their club, their, or, their cl uh, club colors is orange and white, or pardon me, or, orange and black. And uh, that's one of the reasons how we met them. They, they uh, uh, seen our colors and they got a hold of us. I wasn't on that particular run. But uh, then later on, they uh, came down and uh, we uh, became associated together. And we have a halfway run that we do uh, every uh, two years. And uh, every fourth year, the, the other club's responsible for the run. And uh, we're going to go up in, uh, next week, actually, and it's the uh, Greater Vancouver's turn to, for them to uh, put on the run. We've met at different places. We've met at Coburg, Oregon for about the first five years. And then they sold that uh, particular uh, establishment. And we, then we moved down to Sutherland. We've been to Ro uh, Roseburg. We've been to uh, Florence. Back to Sutherland. Uh, Cottage Grove. Uh, uh, and then we went to, uh, last, uh, two years ago, went to Canyonville. Now we're going to go back to Cottage Grove this year. And I, it looks like we're going to have a real good time. And... Uh, Yeah, I'd like to say a few things about uh, when we moved out of the old club hall. Uh, we used to pay uh, our, uh, our, our uh, rent down there was $163. And one of the things that, uh, how we actually got uh, money into the kitty was uh, 
through our, our uh, uh, jackhammer. We, when the jackhammer became uh, popular in the club and we was doing a really good job, we decided to uh, take the uh, money and put it into a building fund. And we voted on it and uh, every bit of our money went into the building fund and we actually bought two pieces of property and each time we would buy the piece of property we would uh, double our money on it. So we was doing really well in that respect, we had uh, like uh, $40,000 in, in the club, and th in those days, that was quite a bit of money. Uh, Don Barksdale owned the club hall at that the particular time that I was in it. I, I, I was treasurer for quite a few years, and I was paying Don Barksdale. He was uh, uh, one of the uh, first black uh, uh, basketball stars for the, uh, 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 the Warriors, or I think in those days, they were called the Golden State Warriors. And... Uh, so uh, we paid uh, to the family, and he, sometimes he would even come over and get the rent, and uh, I'd be working, somebody would come by and pick it up. But we, uh, he, came, he wanted to sell the, the building, and he came to us and said, uh, I have the building for sale, it's going to be $83,000. or Yeah, $83,000, $84,000. And we said, well, we don't want to invest into that particular area. So uh, he sold it. And uh, when he sold it, he uh, uh, instantly we got a uh, a letter from the new new fellow that bought it, and uh, he said that he was really pleased that we was a uh, um, tenant in the building, and that he was going to raise our rent from one hundred and sixty three dollars to twelve hundred dollars, and uh, it wouldn't have taken long to take all of our money and just give it to him. So uh, we uh, sent him a letter. Uh, uh, we had a, a lawyer in the club then, and he wrote up a letter and told him that we was going to be in the uh, in the would be at the club hall for two more months, and we was going to pay him the standard fee. And after the two months, we would be out of there. And so uh, it was quite a transition. We'd, be, we'd been there 40 years; everything's going smooth, and all of a sudden, we're going to be on the outside. So we uh, moved uh, all of our stuff into storage, and then we moved. Uh, there was a, a a restaurant uh, convention hall on 98th Avenue in San Leandro Street called the Blue Lion and they let us use their uh, they, their facilities there we used their bar and it, they didn't charge us for their facilities because we, they was getting benefits from the bar and it was a Wednesday night and it was you know uh, not a real important night to them and so uh, we was in there a year and that's when we found the uh, new uh, location and when we went to the new location, uh, we'd looked at it and they wanted $120,000. Well, there was no way we could buy that. We was looking at a lot of different places. Well, for some reason, and I'm not exactly sure how it worked, but all of a sudden uh, the bank called us and said that if we came down and uh, I think they gave us three days to purchase the property, we could buy it for $71,000. Well, we was down there real fast. And it ended up costing eighty-one thousand dollars, and uh, 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 some of the guys uh, put their names down, and then we was off on a run up to see our sister club, and then we came back and and we built the club hall uh, inside the club hall, and uh, one of the reasons that gave us a lot of inspiration was the Greater Vancouver Motorcycle Club, which is our sister club. Uh, they had a they owned a shopping center, so we had we wanted to be getting close to what they had and or something and actually our, our club hall came out to be very very very, very nice and um, it was uh, uh, some of the things in the club that uh, we uh, uh, some of the runs that we used to do in the past was uh, one of the one of our big runs was up to Clear Lake we used to ride up there and uh, that was a really a party uh, time uh, run but we would go up over St. Helena, and that's quite a ride up the mountain there, and, and then the next day coming back. And that was really uh, one of the, uh, the good rides uh, in the past. And then the other ride that we uh, used to do was, uh, uh, I forgot what it was. <laughs> uh, the three bridge run, we started in at the old club hall, it was started about uh, five years before we left, we left there in uh, 81. And uh, so about five or six years before that, uh, 
they started the uh, uh, when we uh, the three bridge run, and it was done on a Wednesday night, and at, we'd have a short meeting, and then we would go uh, down, and we would take off and go down through just like they do now, but down through the Embarcadero and and through uh, uh, Fisherman's Wharf, and uh, we would uh, generally go over to Sausalito, and there was a place called uh, Margaritaville, and we'd go in there and have a couple of drinks, and and then back across and then come across the bridge. And I remember one night uh, I had, uh, I was working for uh, uh, the Harley shop, uh, or the Kawasaki shop, and we had uh, Ka uh, Kawasaki, I had a Kawasaki a police demonstrator that I rode on that run. And so when we was down in the hollow of the San Rafael Bridge, I turned the lights and the siren on and let them <laughs> whale down through that uh, uh, the, the belly of the uh, San Rafael Bridge, and then when we come up up over the top, I'd shut it down and come on home. And that was always a fun, a uh, very fun ride. Uh, then the Three Bridge Run, we also did that even at the old club hall, when, I mean the new club hall. We'd do that at the uh, new club hall, and we would take off on a uh, Wednesday night and go over and, and do the rides. And then it, uh, we was wanting to put on a poker run because some of our other runs is, uh, was uh, going by the wayside, so we started the three bridge run as a sanction run, we put it on as a sanction run, and uh, that was, uh, it turned out to be a really uh, good ride. Uh, I'd like to say a little bit about the, uh, our, our dual sport. Uh, John White's uh, uh, was the one that uh, w w uh, set up our dual sport, and he came to me and he said, told, told me what he, he'd wanted to do, and I said, well, John, I says, if, if you want to do that, I says, I'll, I'll ride with you at all, all of the events, and we, we used to uh, go out and ride dual sports to just to get a feel of how, how they were run. We did a lot of the, uh, the ridge runners. We went down to, uh, uh, did Death Valley uh, from Lone Pine to uh, Beatty through Death Valley and back. And uh, then we'd go up and, and uh, prior to the, the dual sport, we was setting it up, uh, do mileage. We went up one time in the truck. It rained. We didn't even get out of the truck, but we did set some mileage in the truck because it was all the street portion of the ride that we needed to do and uh, 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 we did that and it, it, that uh, event really come out it used to be a we started out as a two uh, one day event we did a, several years as one day event it started in uh, upper upper lake uh, and we started there at the Honda shop and go over to Stony Ford and uh, have lunch at Stony Ford and then come back to uh, to the uh, upper lake and so we, there were two one day events and then we decided to put uh, the two uh, the two day event on and uh, uh, I'd like to just give credit to John Whites for uh, putting that on another guy I'd like to give some credit to is uh, uh, Al, Dre uh, Al Gregerson uh, Paul Gregerson's brother was the one that started the uh, jackhammer he started the jackhammer he had the fortitude we used to uh, go up and ride at Digger Pines and we was doing uh, Hare and Hounds out of Digger Pines with Richmond and uh, a couple of different clubs. And then Al said he wanted to put an Enduro on, and, but he wanted to move it over to uh, uh, Fout Springs. And we said, Fout Springs, man, that's a long ways away. You know, it's like another 15 miles or maybe 20 miles over there. Well, he, he knew, you know, he knew what the, what the uh, sto uh, story was. He, he could look into the future and see, and it really worked out well for us. We're still putting that on. Uh, I don't know exactly what, how many we put on, but I know it's about 37, 38 uh, years that we've been putting it on. And I, I've worked on every one of them except one. Uh, I went over the handlebars and had a broken arm and didn't get to go on that one. But uh, And an enduro the, the week before. But uh, uh, actually, I worked with Willard uh, and Vernell on the, uh, the first enduro, and we was on the first check. And we was five miles out, and I'll tell you, those people just about run over us. We, we used to put on, uh, uh, we had the limit of 750 riders. Those days we would get uh, 750 riders. We, we limited out on several of those runs, but uh, nowadays we're lucky to get 350 riders. But it's uh, more organized and the people are very serious about what they're doing. One thing about uh, uh, the uh, uh, Enduros at the beginning, everybody had an open face helmet. You'd, uh, you'd know, hey Joe, you know, or hey Jim. And they'd holler at you when they come in, hey, how about a drink of water? You know, they'd stop and talk. Well, today, everybody's got a closed face helmet. They're very serious in what they're doing. You can sit there at, at your check and uh, 
you can know what your key time is and you can hear the bikes about five minutes ahead of time out there someplace and right when that time comes they're coming across the line at your uh, check and it's just amazing how things have changed over the years but uh, I'll tell you we've had a lot of a lot of good times yeah I've been in the club for uh, 44 years and I'll tell you I've really enjoyed it uh, it's been a very a nice life for me um, uh, I couldn't ask for a better life uh, riding with the Oakland Motorcycle Club all the years that we've done different riding and it's really been really nice and uh, one of the things that uh, is nice uh, is my daughter's in the club and last year she was president and it, that was a very uh, nice experience for me she uh, she's been in the club for about uh, four years I think and before that she was in the women's auxiliary and um, it was really good for me but I really enjoyed being in this club it's a, been a quite a life and I just want to thank you guys my name is Tracy Snyder and I have been um, a member since 2003. I have also been an OMCA member. I joined the OMCA in 1999. Uh, my husband and I started riding uh, in the 90s and I really wanted to um, participate with the club and ride uh, with the OMC um, and be a part of this with my father and, um, and I thought the best way to do that would be an OMCA member. Uh, can we stop? <laughs> I'm the fourth generation in my family to be an OMC member. There was Claude Salmon and Lucille. Um, they were my great, great grandparents. Uh, Howard Self and Dorothy Self, they were my grandparents. Um, Mark Norris and Linda Norris, they're my parents. And now my husband, Brent, and I both belong to the club. Uh, this tradition in our family is just an awesome experience. I can see why my family has spent our lifetimes belonging to this club. It just makes uh, life worth living and everything magical. And uh, a lot of people wouldn't understand that unless you're a part of it. When I was a little girl, I used to always look forward to coming down to the clubhouse um, to see the other kids there um, was just really special times. Some of the kids that I grew up with was uh, Tanya and Yvonne. Um, Tanya and Yvonne are Willard's grandchildren and uh, Tanya was um, mine and uh, my twin sister Andra's uh, same age. Um, Yvonne was a little bit older, but um, TC was also about our age. Um, she was just a lot of fun to uh, hang out with. Uh, Kim and Eileen, um, Harless, uh, they uh, used they were a little bit older. Used to always um, take care of Andrew and I. Uh, Billy and Allie Smith, uh, that's Dan Smith's kids. Uh, we used to spend a lot of time with them up at Willard's Ranch. Uh, Mike Vetter, um, he was uh, also part of our group, but Mike Vetter has turned out to be um, almost like a brother to me. Um, he's a member of the OMC and uh, he is just one of my very 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 special friends and it's nice that um, I grew up with these people they are very dear to me and I will know them my entire lifetime now I see the uh, the young kids um, who I call the young kids um, running around our clubhouse today and different members bring down their children and how they have this very nice bond and I know in my heart that they will have these friendships their entire life and I can just see the future of the club. Um, as a uh, youngster I used to go on poker runs with my father 
and always dreaming um, that one day I'd get my own motorcycle. When I was young, I wanted to get a 440 LTD Kawasaki. But when the time came, I got an EX500. Um, Being the uh, daughter of Mark Norris, who was also known as the Kawasaki Kid, of course my first bike was going to be a Kawasaki, but um, after, um, when I decided to get rid of that bike, I got a BMW K75, um, and that was just so I could keep up with the people of the OMC. Um, having that K75, I became a big BMW fan. Um, and since then, I've had the 1150 GS and the 1200 RT. Um, oh, and I recently got a Hayabusa, um, which has always been a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, but where the club has been a lot of influence in me buying motorcycles was the dirt bikes. Um, I wanted to learn how to ride in the dirt. Um, so I talked to a few members and... Um, they suggested an XR250 and we went out and got a lot of gear and um, started going up to Stony Ford with uh, the OMC group and uh, boy did I need a lot of hand holding but um, they got us on all the trails and I've had so much fun riding in the dirt. I remember when we went up to Willard's Ranch and that's where Tanya and Andra and I all got to ride um, a Little Sacks motorcycle for the very first time. And Dad told us, don't use the handbrake, only use the footbrake. So um, we were going around and around and around um, the circle at Willard's Ranch and where we, we stopped was right next to some berry bushes. And so Andra came in and she accidentally hit the handbrake instead of the footbrake and accelerated right into the berry bushes. So when uh, Dad takes and he pulls Andra out of the berry bushes, pulls the bike out of the berry bushes, Andra's covered in head to toe in uh, scars and blood and it was just awful. So it was my turn, so I jump on the bike and I go for my uh, loop around Willard's Ranch and Andra wants to go back to the club, uh, to the, uh, Willard's Ranch and uh, get cleaned up. And Dad says, no Andra, if I take you back to the ranch, then uh, you're not going to get to ride the bike for the rest of the day. If you're going to be a motorcycle rider, you've got to be tough. So Andra toughed it out. She went and got leaves, scraped all the blood off of her, and um, anyway, that comment, you got to be tough if you're going to be a motorcycle rider, was maybe a hard lesson to learn, but very true. And to this day, I get myself into just very difficult uh, terrain in really bad weather conditions where you're just not prepared right. And I think back to those words, if you're going to be a motorcycle rider, you've got to be tough. And uh, Dad was a good one to teach us that lesson. Um, being up at Willard's Ranch was um, just the best place for a kid. And Willard is a great storyteller. And he would tell us these stories about Bigfoot. Um, and we would just be completely scared out of our wits. And I think he did it because he enjoyed to scare us, but I also think he didn't want us to wander off too far because we were a little adventurous, and he wanted to keep us sort of close to the ranch, and uh, we always knew that Bigfoot was lurking. One of the best memories I have is of the opportunity to go to Baja. Not only is it a wonderful place to ride, but um, my dad has been going there for like the last 12 years every January. And in 2001, Brent and I got the opportunity to uh, take two weeks off and go to uh, Baja. Um, and it's just beautiful riding. 
um, to get up and, and the only thing you have to do during that day is ride a motorcycle. It's just too much fun. Um, and it was a great group of people. Um, and I hope that um, I get to go back there and uh, do that with him again. Um, about that trip, um, he, my father actually um, was on his KLR. He was leading the trip and he um, had a bad bearing in his rear wheel. And right before we went over the um, border to enter Mexico, he um, realized that there was no way he could um, take his bike. So I told him, Dad, you and I have put on so many miles as um, with me as your passenger. Why don't you ride my bike and um, I'll be the passenger? And he says, oh, no, I can't do that. I'm like, sure you can. By the end of the night, um, he did say that he would double up with me. We had a, just a very good experience. He did tell me that he would let me ride the bike and he would be the passenger. We did try that once and uh, went about um, a half, of mi half a mile and um, I think it was a real bad experience for both of us. And by the end of that half a mile, I said, hey dad, why don't you just be the rider and I'll be the passenger? And I think we were both a lot happier. Um, I was, uh, I'll say one thing about him. <laughs> um, he did crash my bike that weekend. <laughs> um, we were um, coming back. We were in Catavina and uh, we had stopped to look at these uh, ridings in some caves. And we had jumped off the main road, and we were in this this uh, this dirt. We were going down this hill, and there were so many ruts. And we're on an 1150 GS. We've got these big metal bags, all of my stuff, all of his stuff. The bike was was really heavy. I mean, I'm on the bike. The the bags, you know, are full of just all of our junk. And we're going down this really steep hill with all of these, these ruts. And I'm sort of looking over his shoulder and I'm thinking, I am so glad I'm not riding this bike. And we hit this rut and we went tipping over. I stepped off the bike. Um, and my father was just absolutely mortified. He just couldn't believe that he crashed his, his daughter's bike. And um, put a little nick in the saddlebags. And um, he's just upset. And I looked at it and I said, Dad, I liked my saddlebags before. Now I love them. But uh, we just had um, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time. And it's something I will always remember for my entire life. I feel very fortunate to belong to the OMC, um, to have relationships with all of you. You guys are incredible. And I love you all. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name is Bob Orm. I'm a member of the Oakland Motorcycle Club. Uh, I think they let me in because before they actually figured out what kind of guy I was. <laughs> uh, basic, I've been in the club about, like I said, 10 years. Uh, uh, it's all been, uh, it's been interesting. There's been ups and downs, mostly, uh, mostly ups. It's been a good experience for me uh, for a long time. Uh, I kind of like ran around with a bunch of different motorcycle organizations that were never joining that will shall forever remain unnamed. But anyway, uh, back in about 19, if I remember correctly, it was about 1969, I was uh, riding my uh, Harley Davidson uh, being a hard guy thing and some kid blew me off on some weird looking motorcycle so I went down to uh, the Kawasaki dealer in Oakland it was near uh, High Street and East 14th Street and Mark Norris owned it at the time and I went in there and he was uh, you know he was a real good dude got rid of the Sportster uh, this was like in 1969 it was a 503 cylinder uh, needless to say uh, I uh, painted it black and put psychedelic flowers all over. I was going through a stage at the time. Went through the 60s, did all that thing like that. Uh, and then I was running around with some guys in the, in the San Francisco Motorcycle Club, and he said, hey, let's go over and we're going to play pool. So I went over there, and I recognized this guy at the counter, and I said, don't I know you? 
And he said, yeah, I used to own the Kawasaki shop. He remembered me. And uh, I went by a couple of times and started checking it out. And suddenly I kind of looked around and I checked out the people and everything. And I said, you know, for a bunch of people that I don't agree with, and uh, don't, they're very, uh, they're very cool. So I started coming to the club and put in for membership, got to be a member of the club. Uh, and I guess I was a member of the club about six or eight months. And for some reason, I got elected as president. And then I got in an accident. And the proof of the pudding is uh, I got hurt uh, pretty bad uh, from what they tell me. I don't remember any of it. And uh, Mark Norris and a lot of people in the club came by and were real supportive and stuff. And uh, I went, hey, it, it was cool, you know, like they were wheeling me in in wheelchairs and making arrangements for me to get places and stuff. And I thought, wow, this is really far out. And then Tom Crone, I met Tom Crone down at the club. He's a, a really good member of the club. I don't know if anybody's mentioned Tom Crone. Tom Crone is about the most giving uh, individual I have ever met. He just like he likes to do things for people. So uh, I got to know Tom and stuff. I went to work there. Uh, for Tom at uh, General Dynamics and actually uh, during that five or six year period I made enough money that I'm going to be able to live off of Social Security for the rest of my life. So it's all cool. It's a great organization. Uh, it, uh, I think probably somebody has said it's like being in a family. Uh, it is like being in a family. I'm very, very attached to uh, People, you know, as more time goes by and more time goes by, as people that uh, will do very nice things for you. And uh, and I, I want to mention one thing, uh, and this hasn't, I don't know if anybody's discussed this. Uh, a lot of members of the club are kind of like what you would call old farts, but uh, I've been riding motorcycles since I was 14 years old. I worked at just about every motorcycle shop and organization in the Bay Area. And uh, these guys haul ass, and there's nothing better than hauling ass. Uh, it's the big thrill of my life. Uh, it's almost killed me about a half a dozen times, but this is not a parade group where everybody just kind of like goes down the freeway on their little, should I say Harley? Yeah, I should. Their little Harley thing. Some of these guys got up there and actually jam. Uh, uh, I've ridden with, uh, I've gone on stag runs where guys were going down the road on these like these lame ass BMWs and they were hauling ass. And uh, I like to haul ass. It's the only thrill I get out of life. And uh, I think the club is a great club and I love the club and I really feel that it's like a family. I look forward to be able to like, get down there on Wednesday night and give everybody a hard time. And that's pretty much anything that I have to say about it. Hostum the Muego. Hi, my name is um, Bill Espinola. Um, I live in Castor Valley, and uh, my occupation is uh, real estate. Um, I got involved in the OMC in uh, 2002. Uh, I was introduced to the Oakland Motorcycle Club through um, Tracy Snyder, who at that time was a friend of mine, and um, she had always been um, asking me to come down to check out the club. At that point um, in, my, in my riding career, I had just been... Um, primary a dirt bike rider and I really had no other experiences in, as, in the street riding so I really wasn't that interested in, in, in joining the club but uh, lo and behold I did decide to come down check it out one day and um, kind of checked out what was going on some of the rides that they had been, been putting on and, and I got interested at that point. Um, my first ride with the club was um, to Copper Canyon and that ride was um, was made a great impact on um, on my motorcycle riding. I mean, it was just a great trip, um, something that I probably would never experience in my life if it weren't for um, the club, the, the Oakland Motorcycle Club. So um, I really um, enjoy that 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 um, different trips that you can take and and the camaraderie. Co co Um, I currently serve as the vice president of the club. Um, I've served as vice president in a prior term also, and also I've been a past president of the club, which um, to hold these um, positions is actually quite an honor. Um, 
One of the most um, enjoyable aspects of being a member of the club is um, that we have members of all ages. And it's amazing to see when we have a function or a ride or some kind of social event, how everybody of all ages can come together. Um, you know, we can have a few drinks, we can party, we all enjoy each other's co um, company. And um, the common bond that we do all share is our love of motorcycles. Um, as I had talked about a little bit earlier, um, I was prime before I joined the club. I was primarily, um, mostly, just a dirt bike rider. My father had actually introduced me to um, motorcycles when um, he had bought me an SL70, and it probably was in '71 or '72, and that was my first motorcycle. And I pretty much, you know, had motorcycles all throughout throughout um, my um, as I've been aging up until now. Um, as of today, I own four motorcycles. I have. Um, a KTM dirt bike, I have a Honda Dual Sport, I have a Suzuki, and of course I have the most famous Harley Davidson. Um, before I joined the club, I did no street riding. Like I say, I was just primarily a dirt bike rider. And um, the club has in introduced me to street bike riding, which is, um, it's, it's really cool once you kind of get in it and you have some special friends to share this stuff with. Um, you know, what also and I kind of want to touch bases on is, is amazing about our club. We have, you know, quite a bit of older members in our club. Um, and, and, and if you look at these guys, you know, their looks is, is extremely um, deceiving. Um, for instance, uh, on our last ride that we just got back from this week, we went on a Highway 1 ride. Um, some of these guys, they're in their 70s. They're riding these BMWs. And if you would look at them, man, you would think, man, these guys are just couldn't ride but I'll tell you what the, the the pace is very very fast you better have a good bike and you better have some riding skills to keep up with these guys um, it, it, just on on this one ride this past weekend um, a couple of times I looked down and I'm I'm hitting 110 on my bike and 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 just to see these guys and how smooth they are and how fast they ride um, you could just tell that these these guys have been riding a long time and that just comes with years and years of experience. So um, in closing here, I just kind of want to um, touch bases a little bit. I currently, I have a five-year-old daughter. Um, I tend to bring her down to the club when I can and um, hopefully she can um, see the friendships that I have that I've got and I have formed with the club and hopefully um, when she is older she'll be able to um, carry on the traditions. Hi I'm Brent Snyder otherwise known as Chopped Liver or better known as Tracy Snyder's husband. I've been a member of the Oakland Motorcycle Club since 1999. That's somewhat of a surprise to me. I never planned to be a member of the Oakland Motorcycle Club. In fact I never rode a motorcycle until I was 40 years old. I've been married to Tracy for about four or five years, and one day she came up to me and said, hey, I've signed us up for motorcycle training. I said, why did you do that? We don't even own motorcycles. So, of course, we ended up taking motorcycle training together. In fact, the first time I actually sat on a motorcycle and putted around the parking lot of Concord High School, I went out and got a motorcycle trader and started shopping for a motorcycle. In short order, both Tracy and I had our own motorcycles. We got our licenses after passing the motorcycle training course. And with the help of her father, Mark Norris, we learned to actually ride them. After a little while, we were taking our own trips, for starting out to places like Point Reyes and then as far as Las Vegas through Death Valley. And uh, <laughs> then Tracy suggested we start riding with the club. So we went on several club rides. To make a long story short, we both eventually joined the club. Since that time, I've rarely missed a meeting. I think I have several years of consecutive perfect attendance. And in the meantime, I've served as vice president tw twice, president twice, road captain twice, and secretary twice. And I currently serve as the chairman of the Sheet Iron 300 Dual Sport. When I served as secretary, Noel Manfroy used to sit off to my right. And at the end of every meeting, he kept prompting me to say, 
and a good time was had by all, all at the, to end every meeting. So eventually I wrote that in under the additional notes at the beginning of the meeting to, so I remember to say it at the end of the meeting. And now it's become a tradition that's repeated by secretaries every meeting. My favorite kind of riding are those rides that cover a lot of miles, particularly if they go to places I've never been before. In fact, sometimes I feel like, don't bother waking me up unless it's at least 300 miles. But with the club, I've gone to Baja, I've gone to Copper Canyon, I've gone to Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, John Harrison organized a wonderful ride that went to the Four Corners area where I went to the top of Pikes Peak and points beyond. I went with a uh, ride with Mark Norris and others uh, along the Continental Divide that covered uh, a lot of both paved and dirt roads for several thousand miles on my GS 1150. Probably my most memorable and favorite trip and event with the club was when Tracy organized a celebration for my 50th birthday up in Grants Pass, Oregon. She got she reserved jet boats for us up there, and most of the club came up to celebrate my birthday, and we had a multiple day ride there and back as well. And it was uh, a very memorable time sharing that celebration with uh, friends in the club and great riding, and I just want to say in closing, a good time was had by all. Hi, I'm uh, Duffy Collin. Um from Oakland, I live about 10 minutes from the clubhouse, club hall, <coughs> club hall that is, and I, uh, uh, 53. I've uh, been riding for since I was 12, so a long time. But um, uh, yeah, you know, coming to the OMC was sort of a, uh, uh, I thought sort of a destiny thing almost from from my perspective because I was I was always an East Oakland Moto Bro, which is an anti club. You know, there are a bunch of fast guys that uh, hang out and have been riding together for a long time. And East Oakland Motor Bros, they've always had a skull and crossbones logo that I never really wanted to wear when I was riding my bike because I felt it was offensive to some groups of people. You know, there's some groups of people that consider that very offensive. They just don't like to see skull and, skull and crossbones. And uh, I've always been kind of a, kind of a, uh, um, you know, when it comes to clubs and such, uh, I, I always wanted to kind of, be with a club that had at regular meetings because the OM, because the EOMB was an anti-club and they're uh, they're fun they're fun guys and I love hanging out with them but uh, we rode we rode the I've ridden the jackhammer since the early 80s and I mean, many times probably a dozen times and then I rode the uh, the sheet iron probably six or seven times and then um, uh, I just felt like you know, it's time to give a little back because I've been taking a lot, taking a lot of fun from from the industry and a lot of fun from from the clubs, without really giving much back. So, I uh, decided to come back, come into the club a couple of years ago. This is '05, like May of '05, and uh, and join up because they always seem like a fun group of guys and uh, a lot of good history at the club. And when I was introduced to that club hall, man, I couldn't believe it. I was going, man, this has been in Oakland all this time. And I'm not a member. I live in Oakland. I've been living in Oakland since since '83. You know what am I doing? Not being a member of the OMC. You know, it's so it's like it was almost like destiny. But um, you know, I I haven't been a extremely contributing member because I've got some distractions right now. But uh, I'm sure that all is going to settle down here in a little bit. I'm getting close to finishing my house, and uh, so. But um, it's been fun. It's been fun. It's been a fun time. Um, and uh, I, I have yet to do some really killer rides with, with everybody, some really fun rides. Um, I've done a couple of fun ones, but, uh, but uh, I still got to do the, the stag run and, uh, and you know, some of, those, some of those good ones, some of those really fast ones. Like this one, the Marin ride today, I'm, I regret that I missed that one. Well, speaking of bikes, um, I started... Uh, way back in 68 um, on my Jawa 125 and then a uh, Yamaha 80, Yamaha 175, Yamaha and then I started racing motocross in the in the 70s and uh, uh, reached pro level but um, it didn't really do that well as a pro um, made a little bit of money but always thirds and fourths you know it's just it was kind of minor and 
And about that time, I moved out of the house. So that's when it became too expensive to raise pro <laughs> without making a lot of money. So uh, moved up to Humboldt County, and uh, I was the new kid in town. That song by the Eagles was playing, uh, There's a New Kid in Town. And, uh, and I was the new kid in town up in this little cute little town called Willow Creek, and there was a hair scrambles track. There, there was a little scrambles track with a wooden jump up there. It was pretty famous, actually. A lot of, a lot of flat trackers used to talk about it when I was in Fremont. And uh, lived up there for a couple of years and rode my, my motocross bike uh, in flat track in the expert class. No, in the novice class, because I was, I was an expert motocrosser, but they, but they wouldn't let me ride the expert uh, flat track class. So, so I had to ride the novice class and then intermediate and that kind of stuff. It was pretty fun. It was, there was a lot of the f real fun time in my life when I was 22, 23 years old. But, uh, but then many, many investment bikes and many motorcycles. I've had 38 now as my count now of, of motorcycles altogether. Quite a few of them, though, were just turnover investment bikes. So, But at least I got to experience them and, ha and ride them and stuff. But probably my best, nicest motorcycles I've ever owned were my Ducatis. When I was a Ducati rep, uh, I, had a, I had an ST2 and I had a uh, 900SS. And... Uh, and unfortunately, on the 900 SS, I had a, a deer accident on Mines Road with my sister on the back, and uh, kind of a kind of an interesting story because uh, um, Art Bennett, the 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 writer to Twist Grip Magazine, had just let me tell you this is an interesting kind of an interesting story about the yellow 900 SS's introduction in Northern California. Um, Art Bennett is doing a write-up on one. Uh, and he crashes into a deer on on his road way up in way up in Oregon, and so the magazine needed a bike for pictures. So a week later, I'm I'm called by the magazine, told this story about Art crashing into a deer, but he's okay. He was wearing a zero stitch and everything, and uh, uh, but he rides home on the thing. But the bike is all crashed, so they can't use it for for um, uh, the pictures for the magazine. So they called me up. I went up to. Um, Oakland to the Oakland Parks and took some action shots with with the Trish Group magazine uh, uh, photographer Nick Cedar, and um, a week later I go out on my 900 SS up down Mines Road with a friend, with my sister on the back, and she doesn't have good gear, so I dress down to appease her to make her know that I'm going to be very safe. You know, I'm just going to go slow and take it easy. Because uh, you know, with my stitch on or with my with my Danese suit on, I would I would tend to go pretty fast. But if she doesn't have any gear, so I'm gonna I'm gonna slow down. So we're we're going a pretty easy pace, and we're coming back from the junction because we didn't do the whole loop. We did, we're coming back from the junction, and uh, and sure enough, uh, we're only doing maybe 55 or so where we could have easily been doing 80 or so. Uh, but uh, we're and I I'm, my sister is she goes. Why is he break? And right in the middle of the word break, she, she goes, poof, she launches over the top at about, at about 45 or so whew, with, without much, you know, we both had leather jackets on and, and, and pant, you know, long jeans and, and gloves and boots and full Snell helmets, but that's not real gear. I mean, that's not real motorcycle gear. So she ends up crashing into the creek and she's basically okay. Her shoulders kind of messed up. I uh, I augered into the ground and uh, lacerated a bunch of bunch of parts and uh, you know it's the uh, the old uh, broken pelvis thing and the uh, you know clavicle all that stuff took me about a month to recover it took her about uh, um, took her about a year to fully recover her shoulder but it's funny because two yellow SS's both hit deers 900 SS's in their introductory introductory year here and uh, you know debut kind of thing but uh so anyway but those were some of my funnest motorcycles the ducatis ducatis were great and i still love those bikes i, st I would own one in a second if i could afford one but i just ride a 900 uh, i mean a 919 honda now which is honda's sort of a uh, uh, monster if you will you know and um and then i've got my 650 honda for for off-road i just got my little 110 stolen the other day but uh, that's what i get for uh not putting good locks on my garage door, but anyway. Um, and uh, otherwise, deet, deet, deet. Oh, a bit of an announcer. That's kind of what I do uh, on the side. I have a, a little side business I call Duffy Does Promotions. Duffy Does Productions, or actually. D 
DBA. <laughs> And I announce for the OMC occasionally, uh, you know, the sheet iron, I try to wake everybody up in the morning, jackhammer, enduro, I woke everybody up. And, they, and I did it really quietly at first, and I just slowly brought the level up until it was, and people said, you know, that was an okay way to wake me. For the most part, I got a good response. Most people said, that was a nice way to wake up at the jackhammer, you know, nice little reveille, but kind of quiet, but, you know. So, uh, but then at the uh, at the sheet iron, I did a little promotional announcing there as well, and and then uh, uh, at the uh, Three Bridge, I did a little announcing there too. Larry, Larry just totally let me have the announcing because I had it outside, and that's where the sound was probably best. You know, the the my PA system was on the outside, but um, uh, that's that's all some fun stuff. It's it's just kind of my way of giving back because to the industry because it's a. Uh, uh, I can't make enough announcing uh, to to really. I mean, I I would I would like to get paid three times as much as I get for for announcing, you know. But it's just my way of getting uh, paying back a little bit. I do get paid for it, but uh, um, typically, uh, you know, especially for the OMC, I'm just doing that for free, of course. But uh, it's it's all good stuff. It's all fun, and I try to inject my uh, my history of. You know, for years, uh, I've always been uh, a guy that's been real animated, and you know, I, I tell jokes with with a lot of a lot of per, uh, a lot of different kind of accents and such. And uh, and typically, uh, I'm I'm kind of known for like motorcycle noises and stuff like that. But uh, we won't go there just yet. So I guess you know, this is sort of how I'd announce a race. If I was announcing like a Supercross. Um, and it's it's Carmichael and it's uh, it's Bubba, you know. This is sort of the excitement I would try to bring to it. Whoa! Look at this! Look at them too! That look at the air! These guys are getting on the triple! Unbelievable! Look at Ricky Carmichael just overtook Bubba! Unbelievable move! He just put it to him. He stuffs him in the turn. It is unreal! Look at the power these guys are showing on these 450s! It's unbelievable! Look at this! You know, that kind of stuff. That's that's sort of how I do it. I try to, I try to bring some uh, some excitement excitement and inflection to the thing, but. It uh, doesn't always come out that well. <laughs> yeah, you know, one of, one of my first uh, official things that I did with the OMC was uh, to help a good friend of mine, Richard Jung. He's in East Oakland Motor Bro. He's a pretty proud East Oakland Motor Bro. He's the guy that actually does a lot of the artwork for him. But he uh, is a really good rider, and he was he had qualified to go to the ISTE in 05. And uh, so... Uh, one of the first things I did when I was at the OMC was ask them to use uh, their facility for the fundraiser for him, and it uh, it was a great event. Um, I mean, we promoted it, and we just I just emailed like crazy, and uh, we just called a lot of people, and OMC was gracious enough to lend us the club hall, and uh, I mean, it was the place was packed. We had a lot of folks in there. We raised I think 7,500 bucks or somewhere in that neighborhood, somewhere around eight grand for. For, uh, for Richard Jung to do the ISDE that year, and uh, his license plate on his uh, on his Dodge van ISDE 05, you know, pretty cool stuff. But uh, yeah, thank the thanks to the OMC for uh, for lending the club hall on that one. That was that was a great event, especially for Richard. You know, I got to tell you, um, the sheet iron dual sport that's been this is the 16th running. I think we just did this last time. Um, that ride. Is has got to be one of the all-time greats. I, you know, I wrote it for all those years before I was an OMC member. But um, my friends and I, uh, my East Oakland Motorbro friends, uh, will, uh, I mean, are just we just have such a good time on that ride. We we're constantly uh, dealing with, uh, you know, we're sort of racing the whole ride. We we really really go fast on it, and especially the last day, the second day. When we're going up the Go Road, which is which is the back of Sheet Iron Mountain, and it's literally four lanes wide gravel, and it's just awesome. I mean, we are doing 70 mile an hour broad slides on our 650s, and my buddies on their KTM 525s, and it's just it's unbelievable. We stop at the top, and we'll take videos of this this high speed sweeper. And everybody's just laid out, sliding sideways on their 650s. We'll we'll go back and do it again and again, you know, just to get video of it. And it's uh, the sheet iron uh, that that particular 
uh, section that that we all look so forward to that section because it's it's a good 15 minutes of, of fast fast turns with hardly I mean hardly any traffic of course we're always watching for that but you know it's uh, I don't think we've ever seen anybody coming down the hill uh, on that particular one but we're always ready for it but it's uh, is just the most fun part of that whole ride is that is that one 15 minute section of the back of Sheet Iron Mountain You know, and uh, uh, one, one of the things I do occasionally, uh, uh, I do this thing, it's sort of a motorcycle comedy routine, if you will. I, I, I started like Rod Serling. I go, ladies and gentlemen, imagine, if you will, a man in his 40s, uh, early 50s, making motorcycle sounds with his mouth. You're about to enter the moto zone. You know, and I, I get into uh, I get into all kinds of different sounds like, well, name that bike. You know, I always do this. Name that bike, okay? I'm the only guy I know that needs windshield wipers on the inside of my car. That's my Honda 100, right, with a Bassani pipe. Wait a minute, Bassani pipe. Bassani, are they around anymore? No, I don't think so. But okay, here's my Triumph 750 on the half mile. Okay, this is this is one of my most coveted sound effects. Okay, now this is kind of graphic here. Well, oh, hang on, it turns into a single once in a while. Straight away. San Jose half mile. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> it's gotta be 750. Turns into a single again. Oh man, I'm losing the 750. Damn. Going by the crowd. Who's that, Hank Scott? No, I don't know. Something like that. But, and that's the end of uh, Duffy Collins' interview. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the uh, <laughs> the sound effects guy, if you will. Hi, I'm Larry Stewart. Uh... I've been a member of the Oakland Motorcycle Club since 1993, and uh, I joined the club after meeting Don Pitcock, one of our longtime members. He brought me down to the club, and we went through uh, the usual introductions where you have to remember 65 people's names in two weeks, and that sort of thing that every new member goes through. Um, during those early years when I was in, uh, it was quite a different club than it was now. Uh, many of them were long-term members, 20, 30 years at a time. And I particularly wanted to mention uh, Lee Sherman, George Bacon, Charlie Bellman, and Don Turkletop, who were uh, the real anchors of the club at that time, who passed away, each of them, within three to five years after my joining, but were very instrumental in keeping the club going and especially Don Turkletop, who was always uh, very friendly to new members, made sure they understood all the different types of rides and events that we did. Uh, Don was really a great guy, and I hope uh, the club remembers him for a long time. Uh, once you get in the OMC, it's uh, a lot of fun to do more things, uh, get involved in a lot of different things. I was president first in 1996, then in 2000, and this year our 100th anniversary, 2007. Our members have made a <clears throat> really strong effort to make this 100th anniversary year a stellar event, and we've had some very successful ventures, uh, particularly the uh, sheet iron enduro that Brent Snyder organized. Uh, the Three Bridge Run and, of course, the Jackhammer Enduro that Brian Jagger does a great job with. And another thing that's very important, I think, is in the success of the club to notice how many really outstanding and participating new members that we've gotten over the last two years. It's something in the range of 16 to 18 new members over the last two years. 
One of the things that's most interesting about the Oakland Motorcycle Club is to discuss with the members how they first got involved in motorcycling. Mine was a little different uh, because when I moved out here from the East Coast to go to graduate school at Berkeley, I uh, couldn't afford a car and there's no place up there to park one anyway. And a friend of mine had a 175 Benelli who uh, decided he would teach me how to ride. Well, the first couple of weeks, I put a few dents in that Benelli, I want to tell you, on the streets of Berkeley. But after a couple of weeks, I finally got the hang of it, and I bought, a, for the old timers, they'll remember, a Honda 150 Dream. And I commuted from my apartment to the campus for a whole year on that. And I discovered I really liked riding, so after I got out of school, got a job, started to make some money, uh, I got a 250 Ducati, which at the time was a reasonably big bike, and uh, rode a lot on the street. And then somebody told me about Hayward Speedway and how it was a lot of fun to go out there on Saturday nights and watch the races. So that's exactly what I did along with my friend uh, who had the 175 Benelli, which was now destroyed. He now had a BSA Victor 441. And uh, we went out to Hayward Speedway on Saturday night and watched the races and thought it looked like so much fun that we came home that week, took the license plate, headlight, taillight, everything off him. And the next Saturday night, we were out at the starting line at Hayward Speedway and didn't do very well. I remember the first uh, heat I was in, I said, man, I'm really going fast. This is about as fast as I can go. And I think I escaped being lapped by about 30 feet by the leader. So then I realized you have to go faster than this. And uh, I wound up doing that kind of TT racing, motocross, enduros for about 10 years. And then I didn't ride for about 10 more years and I decided I wanted to ride on the street. And I bought a 1200 Harley Sportster that I rode for about a year and it got kind of boring riding by myself. And I met Don Pitcock, who's uh, one of the greatest guys ever in the OMC, Papa Don, we call him. And he told me about the OMC, and I went down there, and that was the beginning of a lot of fun. Yeah, the bikes I've owned, uh, they've been uh, quite a different lot. As I mentioned, I had the Honda 150 Dream to start with, and I had a Ducati 250 then a Boltaco 250, then a Boltaco 360, and I wound up my dirt career on a Mako 360. When I started riding the street, I had a uh, Harley 1200 Sportster, and then I went through the usual progression of Harleys to a lowrider. Um, then I had an Ultra Classic, and uh, my wife rode with me most of the time on those bikes, and the last Harley I owned was a 2000 Road Glide. And right now I have a uh, 1800 Goldwing with ABS and a BMW K1200 RS. A lot of the <clears throat> OMC members have a lot of favorite rides. My favorite ride that I can remember from early in the club, and I think it was Gary Cristiani who organized this, was a ride to the Lake Topaz Casino over Monitor Pass, up Highway 88, and I'd never been up in that area at all before. And Gary uh, took us up there, and that had to be 12, 13 years ago. I thought it was such a great ride and such a great place that I've been taking the members there on an annual ride every year for nine years now. And I think uh, most of the members would say it's one of their favorite rides because of the scenery and the highway and that sort of thing. The other remarkable rides are always the halfway runs where uh, with the group I usually go with, uh, we go all the way up 101 to Crescent City and stay there overnight. Uh, then we take the uh, eastern road uh, that goes into Oregon and then find some crooked road to come back on. It's usually five or six days. But the halfway run, uh, meeting the Canadians and partying with them for two weeks is really a lot of fun and I recommend that to everyone. One of the things that I'm most proud of and I think shows the real quality and character of the people in the OMC is our outstanding club hall. We're one of the 
very few clubs to own a property even remotely that well done to say nothing of the uh, significant expansion fully paid for that was carried out in 2006. Uh, it takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, and uh, a lot of dedication on the part of the parts of the members now, but especially the older members who were the ones to discover, renovate, build that club hall when the club did not remotely have the funds that it does now. And those those members uh, will always be remembered for all the effort, their own money, their own time to give the current members that outstanding club hall. Hi, my name is uh, Brian Jagger. I've been a Oakland Motorcycle Club member for 25 years. I uh, worked for Xerox for 25 years and then retired, or early retired, and went to uh, work as a handyman for the last 10 years, so kind of sticking around. Been uh, involved with the club and the Jackhammer in particular for almost since the Jackhammer's inception, which was 1970. I missed the first year, and then as a friend of the club, I kept coming up <laughs> and wouldn't go away for about 10 years. Uh, slowly started uh, riding uh, the event the weekend and then said, geez, that was fun, and I think I'll go uh, ride uh, one extra day, maybe help put it on. That worked its way even before I was a club member for uh, a week of my vacation every year. <laughs> and so I guess I enjoyed it. <laughs> and uh, for the last 10 years, I've been enduro chairman for the Jackhammer. So this year, uh, 2007, is the, I think, 38th Jackhammer. So anyway, I've been around a little while <laughs> and had a lot of good times, a lot of memories. Uh, um, Al Dring was my sponsor. Uh, Jerry uh, Boyer, Jab, was uh, my other sponsor. Uh, when I joined, the clubhouse was being built, so they, uh, they did a lot of, a lot of work. I uh, must admit I did not participate in that work, but, but uh, I saw the, in, the, the, the results, which are really super. And uh, when I joined, they were having uh, meetings at a restaurant bar kind of a place, so that's, that's where I came into the club. Uh, most of my riding has all been dirt and dual sport. I finally, um, uh, 2005, I bought a, a real dirt, a real street bike, I guess, a, a BMW 1200GS. And so, between injuries, I'm riding it quite a bit now. <laughs> so, <laughs> just got back from the uh, halfway run, 2007, 100, and uh, it was a fun time. Put to it put uh, almost 1,400 miles on in, in the weekend. Did not take the direct route, up or back, <laughs> especially back. Put 600 and something miles in one day. <laughs> so it was fun. <laughs> uh, over the years, uh, the Jackhammer Enduro, uh, like I said, it was uh, up 38 years, but it was all started by a guy named uh, um, Al Gregerson, who's uh, Paul Gregerson, is still an active club member. Al is an honorary, but he started in 1970 before I was a club member, and he probably ran it for boy, it's got to be 10, well maybe not 10, but about eight years. It was quite a long stint for him. And from there, a guy named Wally Bacon, who's uh, uh, no longer a club member, but uh, he ran it for two or three years. Um, then, uh, honorary member, uh, uh, let's see, um, who is it? <laughs> Blank. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, Tom Hutzler was the next one. He, uh, he ran it for probably five or six years. Then, uh, Ken Stevens came along and he's, uh, uh, no longer an active member, but he is a member of the club. Um, then Ray Val, the, uh, the old enduro rider from way back, ran it for five or six years, and his wife and that. Um, and then ten years ago or so, I took over in 97. 
and so I've been doing it. So that's kind of the all the people that were involved in the jackhammer from the start, at least chairman. Now, the rest of the club <laughs> uh, has helped over the years a, a heck of a lot because, uh, you know, it takes 75, 100 people sometimes to put on this enduro. The OMCA does a lot of stuff uh, on the checks, on the course, sign-ups, trailer. There's a, lots of activities on the jackhammer. And it's the first real moneymaker that the uh, club ever uh, got with the jackhammer funds, especially in the old days when you had 750 riders for a few years. We did a national one year, <laughs> and uh, we had a lot of riders. Nowadays, we're hovering around 200. It still makes money for the club, but it's not the uh, premier moneymaker, which is our sheet iron now. So, but it's uh, it's the one that probably gave us a bankroll that funded the clubhouse <laughs> and and uh, and gave us some opportunities to uh, uh, develop some assets, I guess, <laughs> and had a heck of a lot of fun at the same time. So still have big campouts and a lot of trips up to Stony Ford and uh, generate a lot of fun, I think, over the years. And you'd be surprised who rode dirt bikes in the old days, guys that you'd never think they ever saw dirt, <laughs> and they started that way. So anyway, there's a lot of a lot of fun in the past anyway. So. Over the years I uh, I had other bikes I'm trying to think. I started out with a 305 Scrambler. I, I called it a dirt bike but <laughs> it really wasn't. <laughs> and then uh, and I bought me a DT1 uh, 200 uh, Yamaha, 250 Yamaha. And I still have that bike although it's sitting in a shed. If I touch it too much it just kind of things fall off it. <laughs> so It's a restoration project. But. That was the original kind of dual sport. You know, I started out on the street with it, and then and slowly migrated over to uh, dirt only. Still have all the stuff though. But one of my best vacations was on that bike going up up north uh, with a friend of mine on a um, a Bull Taco per sang 250. That kind of dates everything, <laughs> but we had a good time. No no agenda. Just said we'd head north and spent 10 days up into Oregon and back down the other side of the Sierras and home and uh, on a 250 street bike. How's that? <laughs> then uh, from DT1s I went to Mako's and Jerry Boyer, my sponsor, and uh, another good friend, Dave Catano, um, ran that shop. They bought it from Jim Johnson, which is Campus Suzuki, and goes way back. Uh, used to be on uh, University in, well, near University on San Pablo in Berkeley. And so I bought a lot of Makos, and at one time it seemed like if you were a dirt rider in the OMC, you had a Mako. <laughs> So I went through uh, a good number of those and kept the last one, my poor 1981 Mako I rode for 10 years until it just about, or probably more than that, almost 15. <laughs> and uh, it never left me stranded though. It's not like the name implies, Mako Braco. It was a <laughs> good running motorcycle. <laughs> but anyway, from there I went to um, a Honda XR400, which I still have, still running. So it's been, kept me going on the dirt and dual sport itself. And as I mentioned, I went to a GS for a road bike, so I really have a bike now that I can call a road bike. <laughs> so I think that's it. I probably have a couple of rides that I could talk about that uh, left impressions on me. And uh, one of them was an invitational from uh, GVMC, actually. It went up to Canada on their Poison Mountain ride. Uh, this is a few couple years back, about five or six years back. But uh, they uh, invited a, a few of us uh, dual sport dirt riders up there. So I loaded up my uh, XR400 and uh, uh, Jim Weiss, who's an ex-club member, and his brother John Weiss is still a member, um, volunteered to do the traveling up there. So we loaded all the gear and he put it on the back of a on a trailer and uh, a van and and uh, uh, took off with all the bikes, met his cousin up there in Washington, I believe, uh, and uh, picked us, uh, myself and uh, Steve Smith, who was an ex-club member, 
uh, at the airport. So we flew in for the ride. <laughs> he picked us up after driving several days and, and stopping along the way with relatives in Oregon to dirt ride and stuff. So it wasn't all work, I don't think, <laughs> for him. But, but anyway, he picked us up and um, at the airport we crossed into Canada and met Tom Tinnerman and a few of the other So anyway, we met all the uh, all the GVMC guys that were up there, and and uh, we had to carry all our gear on the back of the bike. So we had it all in a big waterproof bag. And weather the first day was uh, overcast, but kind of nice. And they said this is the dry area of Canada, so uh, we weren't uh, we were prepared, but hoping for the best anyway. So the first day was excellent. You, you couldn't believe it. It it, it had. It rained a little, it snowed a little, the sun was out a little, but never overwhelming, you know, it was just great. We went through beautiful, beautiful country. Uh, they really gave us a good tour, went up, uh, looked at mines, old, old cabins and log cabins and meadows, and, and uh, we got to uh, a couple of creek crossings, which was always interesting. I was on my XR400, which was relatively new at the time, and... Uh, they kept volunteering me to go across these rivers because I had the smallest bike. <laughs> so they were a couple of people were riding GSs and uh, some heavy bikes, you know, 650s and stuff like that. So they kept wanting to throw me out in the water <laughs> to get across. Well, Steve Smith took off with his uh, DR350 uh, and uh, got about halfway across. And just as he went down, the kill the engine but he, it went everything but the handlebar was showing <laughs> it was underwater the handlebar was the only thing sticking out so we were trying to stay halfway dry well five or six of us ran out there and got soaking wet dragged his bike out of the water and flipped it upside down and pumped on it for I don't know how long finally got it running got everybody else across and then he says oh by the way we still got across the same river <laughs> about three more times <laughs> well Needless to say, after the a few extra trials and errors, we were we were all crossing them pretty pretty uh, quickly. And the, the last one we just blasted and and got across. But everybody was soaking wet. And uh, those nice Canadians, they kept saying, "Don't worry, there's going to be shelter for the evening." And here I am, my boots full of water, I'm soaking wet. Gear I think was dry. It was inside a bag, but I have no idea if it was dry or not. But I. And I'm, I'm picturing a little, you know, shed in the forest or a lean-to made out of twigs or something and uh, figuring, man, how am I going to survive the, the, the night here? Well, as we kept riding, we kept getting into uh, more, all of a sudden we're out of the wilderness. We start seeing kind of, you know, a couple of cabins and streets, uh, you know, that almost look like uh, something that uh, represented the civilization. We go around the corner, and here's this beautiful log cabin <laughs> with a nice green tin roof right on a lake. And uh, uh, some of the GVMC friends had opened up the cabin, had a barbecue going, had homemade cookies, beer, wine. <laughs> we took all our boots off and went in the house, and the, the floors were all heated tile. <laughs> and beautiful accommodations, I couldn't believe it, and great hosts. So we had a, a wonderful time, and I was thrilled to pieces after <laughs> thinking of my lean-to that I was going to be spending the night in. <laughs> well, the next day, it kind of went along, and, uh, and the next day was a little bit uh, more the Canadian weather that I've always envisioned was raining. And we got up, got our gear on, and we said, well, it's just a light sprinkle. So went down the hill to a lake and uh, went had breakfast at a restaurant down uh, in this little burg and got gas. We kept watching out the window of the restaurant, looking, saying, oh, it's going to be uh, you know, a nice day. It should be good. And uh, ended up raining more and more and more. <laughs> so we got on this old mud road that went around the lake for, uh, it seemed like 20, well, probably 30 miles. <laughs> and by the time we got off of that, we were all the same color, all gray, <laughs> gray mud. <laughs> But we stopped at a restaurant again and had a couple of beers and uh, some chili and decided to cut the trip a little shorter and blitz down the highway to back to camp. But it was one of the most memorable rides I've ever had. And uh, I keep saying I want to go back and run the Poison Mountain again, uh, if, if they'll ever invite me again. <laughs> so, so we'll see. 
<laughs> see what happens. The only other funny one is kind of a, a story about Stony Ford. And it happened just a little while ago. And me and my son, um, Tracy uh, Snyder and Don, uh, uh, Mike uh, Donaldson were up uh, riding, uh, and I think it might have been a couple more people. But anyway, we were up riding, and, and Mike Donaldson's it was his first uh, first time really out on a street bike or a dirt bike. So we were taking it easy and stuff, and we'd stopped at the meadow up there in Stony Ford. And it had been raining, and you know it was a I think springtime of the year. And uh, so we all took off and said, okay, we're going to go around the meadow. And so we went around the meadow, and me and my son were out in front, so we took a little trail around this long, flooded part of the road, and it was off to the left, and we went around, and, and I decided, well, let's wait at the far end. So they come around. Um, uh, we'll take an easy trail instead of a, or a road rather than a trail just to make it a little easier. They're getting tired. So, so we go around, and we park at the far end of the lake, <laughs> or the water, <laughs> which was flooded, but uh, a flooded road on the meadow. But uh, uh, as as Tracy and uh, Mike came around the corner, they saw us at the far end and didn't even see the trail. It bypassed the whole thing off to the left. So they hot rod right on through this lake and standing on the pegs and just grinning and having a good time, just blitzing right down the middle of the lake. Well, at the very end, it got a little deeper. <laughs> And uh, Tracy made it out, I think, okay, but Mike did a spectacular one, and just the, the bike just slowly submerged as, as he got to the deep part, and over the handlebars he goes, spread eagle right in front of the bike, <laughs> totally soaked <laughs> underwater. <laughs> and uh, we pull him out, and we have since called the lake, although it's only a seasonal lake, but it's, it's named after Mike as uh, <laughs> Mike's Lake on the meadow. So <laughs> but... Uh, but we got him up and running and, and pointed him in the right direction. And, and uh, I think he had a good time, but I got to admit, I haven't seen him out on, the, on a, a dirt bike since, so I'm a little concerned now. <laughs> anyway, it, it was a fun time. <laughs> uh, I guess one of the things I should mention about it is uh, over the years, my family has really helped out off and on. Uh, when I first took over chairmanship, my wife, who's not an OMCA member, but my wife Kim, helped run the trailer and organized it for two or three years before Tracy Snyder took over. And uh, both my daughters, uh, Lisa uh, and Stacy, have helped out on three bridge runs over the years and, uh, and still participate in uh, helping out on the jackhammer uh, in the trailer and or out on the course doing things. And then my son Aaron was mascot for about three or four years and finally outgrew that, <laughs> ended up joining the Army. So he's in the Army at the moment, but uh, he's done a lot of riding over the years with me and working on the jackhammer and, and, uh, and just being there when you need some uh, grunt work. Turned into a darn good rider, I don't know. He, uh, he's uh, faster than I am, that's for sure. <laughs> and. Uh, I think he'll get back into it when he gets out of the army again. He sold everything, but uh, he's still talking about it. So I think I think he'll do it again someday. So hopefully, uh, uh, in a few years, be back into it. <laughs> you wouldn't be diverse if you weren't bad mouth I me, mean, I'll tell you that. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you guys you guys do know each other, I take it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, we've all made a lot of club. We've made a lot of runs together. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mostly uh street runs or dirt runs or Yeah, most of ours was street with When did you join, Don? I don't know, in nineteen sixty three I think. Somewhere around there, about 32 years ago. Yeah, you. It was 63 because I would have been one years old. I would have been 44 years. 
Huh? It would have been 44 years. What? Ago that you joined. Now, 63 qualifies you as an old timer. 73. Well, you don't have to ask, just take oh, a look. I mean, I <laughs> but that, that makes you and me very old timers. Well, I just yeah. looked at a calendar out there that I made, helped make, and that was uh, 1967. Or was it 76? Well, you and I have got. No, 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 not the 60s. I don't, no, 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 73. 73, that's it. Right. You and I got honorary members the same night, remember? Mm-hmm. There's life member and then there's honorary life member. Yeah. What's the difference? Well, the life member a life member is done by the amount of time you're in the club. I believe it's twenty years. An honorary member is voted on by the members before you ever get to that time. A minor was given to me in the first ten years I've been in the club. When I finished this club all. I got mine for working the hill climbs and making the runs and and uh, working over at the other club and so on. Well, you were the big instigator on this clubhouse. Huh? You were the big instigator on this clubhouse and the way it's built and looks right now. I know. I drew the plans. I know you did. I also spent a year of my life building it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never went anywhere for a year, not even on a motorcycle. Somebody told me that you went home and drew the plans for this on it. Uh, brown paper bag from the grocery store. I still got it. Still got it? <laughs> yeah, well, it was a brown paper, but it wasn't a bag. <laughs> but where I work, big rolls of wrapping paper. I use that. Well, you've done a hell of a good job. I'll yep. tell you that. It's good. We put in a lot of time building. I'll tell you that's something the club needed. I tell you what, they needed that. You know, needed somebody to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Looks good. A ramrod in the house. That's right. Is this door open so the girls can drive in? <laughs> I, well, actually, no. It's for you can get the beer and stuff into the. Well, that's what I figured. Chet, Chet's gonna what was our other club? Was, was it on San Pablo, yeah. wasn't it? Wasn't it? <clears throat> okay, my name's Jim Means. I belong to the club since 1953. And I joined when the old building we had, well, I lived over in, in uh, Richmond, and San Pablo area. I came over here to join the club and I got sponsored by all some of the old timers, which was Wendy and Howard and, and Turkletop. And Turkletop's the one that conned me into coming over here and trying it out, made a few runs. And after I made a few runs with him, well, he said, uh, well, you ought to join. He said, we ride the dirt and then we ride the street. Well, that's what we was looking for, because we had bikes. Them days, most of them either dirt riders or they was street riders. So we, uh, I said, that sounds good. So I went ahead and joined. And then after I joined a little bit, they said, now, how, are, you, are you happy with the club? Oh, yeah, it's fine. We're doing this and we're doing that. He said, now it's initiation time. And I said, what's that? And me and Turk, and there was about, I don't know, there was 12 or 14 of us. And they had a whole line of us. We went through there, and he put old rags over our head, and we, and we, all we had on was our shorts and our T-shirt. And then they wrapped us up in old, looked like an old towel or some kind. And then they, ever he come up and he said, "Tell me your name." And he smacked me over the head with an egg, and it run down through here. And then he marked me all up like that, and he said, "Boy, you guys are looking good. Let's go down and go for a ride." So we had to go out and get on our bikes, and we were all up down the main street, and people looking at it hollering at us, hey, here comes the freaks, you know. And we got back in, and they said, well, you guys go clean up now, and said, and we're going to have some fun. Turkletop says, I can't, you broke my cigars. And he had a fit, so they bought him a drink and, and got him another cigar. Well, that's just one of the highlights. We did have a lot of fun there. What we did also, we used to have the bicycle field meets up our real strong stair, stairway we had going up. We had them, them, old, uh, them old crates they used to put in the, the beer and the soda pop. And uh, so they had them stacked up above the, the stairway. Then they got the old bikes out and they had four rows. Now on each row of the bike, at the end of it, the end of the hallway, they had an old tire, an old car tire or a motorcycle tire, each end and back here, they give you five can of beer cans. 
or, or oil, oil cans. That's what they had, some old oil cans. And then we all got up, and you had to go down and turn around here and drop, drop it in, come back, get another one, go back till you had all five of them in there, and you was a winner. And that was a madhouse. We didn't knock each other down. They couldn't turn the corners. And them long-legged guys, they could just sit down like this and turn them around like that. And the short-legged guys, we, we had it. Hard. But we had a road against the other clubs, usually, or our own, whatever it was. That's just one of the highlights that we used to have a lot of fun through there. And uh, it's, it, was, uh, it was good. I, I really enjoyed it because there was something going on all the time. And as soon as the meeting is over, we had, then of course we had dances and so on then too. And it, it was very interesting. I think old Chet could probably enter in some more there. Now Jim said just about all of it except that I think the most fun that I've ever had with this club is on the overnighters. The old uh, snow runs that we used to have in Clear Lake, boy, they, they, they were good runs. Uh, we, we, we had more fun on them than anything. But I've always had fun with this club, always. Uh, Jim joined, he got me in. He's got two weeks on me. We both joined in 53. But I, I, I can't think of anything, any place, any organization that I'd rather be a member of than the Oakland Motorcycle Club. It's just, it's just a, a good, friendly group, a lot of comradeship, uh, uh, everybody's, Everybody's out for each other instead of against each other, and uh, I don't know, I, I just like it. I'm not a real active member anymore. I'd like to be, but I live too far away, and uh, the price of gas kills me. So I'm not a real active member, but uh, I wish I was. Can't ride anymore, but uh, that's, another, that's another story. But at any rate, I, I love the OMC, I always have and always will. And I guess that's about it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Chet Gardner. I joined the club in 1953. Uh, Jimmy Means here is the one who sponsored me into the club. Uh, 54 years of happiness is all I can say. I'm retired, uh, was a long line truck driver and had to fight to get the club for a lot of, a lot of times. But at any rate, uh, I, I guess that's about it. 1953 is a long time, but I'm happy with it. You know, up at Redwood Park, up there where we used to used to be a motor OMC playground. If you rode the when you ride in the dirt, you go up to Redwood Park. That's that whole park was theirs. And uh, so they said, now that uh, you want to ride the dirt, well then you've got to earn it. And uh, I had a 3974 flathead, and it was a blunger. And when you went down this hill, you went right down to bottom, and there was three ruts in water this deep. And you didn't know, uh, the front wheel went in one rut, the rear wheel went in another one. There you went. They all around the top up there waiting, hollering and all this. It took me seven times before I could get out of there. Cause it was slick and muddy to get out of there. And they, they did one right after another till we all got to do it. And uh, I don't think they do that anymore either, you know. They don't make it tough on Of course, nowadays the bikes is completely different. It ain't like it was. That was a uh, workout there. That thing was a, a sled <laughs> compared. I, uh, I don't know what else that, uh, that we used to do. We used to, uh, he'd come in and he said, we, in, our, in our till there, we got a little money. Let's, let's throw a dance. So we'd have a dance and we'd go to either our, our club or the other club. Then out at Sand Hill Ranch, we used to go out there to the ranch and uh, we used to, there would be four, three or four clubs. We'd go over there and have a, have a nice get together and a dance and so on. Then our club runs, we used to go to Clear Lake and, and up there that we had a, a dance contest. And uh, I never did win it. I, I got second one time. And, but anyway, that's another thing that we did. We thought well, that was good. And uh, at that time I lived in an old barn out of San Pablo. 
and the Richmond Ramblers, and there was Bugsy Mann and, and uh, Dorstein, all these big uh, number one riders. They come out and, and it played out there on our little playground we had there. We got to know them and it was really nice. Then we'd have a group, we'd go to Belmont. Belmont was every Friday night. You didn't live till you went to Belmont for the races. So we went and watched all of the big guys there. And well, we had a lot of fun and we come back to the clubhouse and the, everybody really enjoyed the club at that time. And I don't know what else I could say about that now. Chet, you got something? Now, I remember that barn real well that Jim used to live in. That was, that was our meeting place. Tank Farm Hill was right behind it. We go down there, go down to the barn and, and mess around with the motorcycles and go up on the hill and play and come back down and mess around with the motorcycles and go back up on the hill and play. It was a meeting place. Uh, Dickie Dorstein, Bugsy Man used to come by all the time. Uh, of course, they, they, they rode BSA in Triumph, so they didn't care too much for us. We rode Harley Davidson's, you know. But we, we had good times. We, we, we always had good times. We, whatever, wherever we went, Jim and I have been riding together since 1952. And uh, we, we, we always had good times, every place we went. We, we, used to, we used to strike out on our own. And uh, we went to, uh, what was it, Long Barn, I think, on the snow run one yeah. year. And Jim and I rode up by ourselves. And we didn't, we didn't go up with a club. We just went off by ourselves. And we went up some, some back road. I don't remember which one it was now. We come around one of them blind corners. And there's a whole herd of cows in the road. And we both locked up the brakes. Cows looked at us, we looked at them, we honked our horns, they didn't move. We had a hell of a time getting through that bunch of cows, but we made it. But we, we've always had good times riding. And uh, we, neither one of us ride any. Well, Jim would, Jim would ride if he had something to ride. He's got something, but he just won't fix it up to ride it. But uh, I can't ride anymore, unfortunately, for medical reasons. But I wish I could. I really miss it. Uh, you tell me maybe a little bit about uh, the different motorcycles that you guys have owned from throughout the years. Well, my, all of mine, primarily. Uh, uh, I rode Harley Davidson for years and years and years, and uh, then I then I bought a 750 Suzuki, traded it off on a Goldwing, uh, traded it off on a Suzuki 1100. Traded it off on a Yamaha 1300, and then that's when I got to where I couldn't ride anymore. But uh, that, that's the only foreign bikes I had. Well, years ago when he had the barn, I had a, what was it, a Jawa. A, you had a Jawa. Then. I had a Jawa, yeah. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was the weirdest motorcycle I'd ever seen. Twin pipes on a single cylinder. Uh, it, but it, it, was, it was a little duller, it was only about what, 15, 20 cubic inches, something like something that? Something like that. But it, it was fun. It was fun to ride. I'll tell you one thing about that bike. The Kickstarter, you start it, and after it started, then you take the Kickstarter and push it to the front, and then you, that's where you pumped it through the gears. Now, that yeah, was weird. Yeah, that was weird. <laughs> that's different. I, I remember the first time I started it up, I couldn't figure out how to shift gears. I'm sitting there looking like this, and somebody came up and threw the Kickstarter over to the front and said, now shift it. <laughs> it. It was fun. We had a member in the club. It's a big guy. Name was George Post. And he says, hey, I want to ride that little thing. And he took it up on Tank Farm Hill. He virtually destroyed it because he, he weighed over 200 pounds and it was a little bitty motorcycle. But he says, well, he says, it goes pretty good, but he says, not like Bob BSA. We, we, we had good times, always had good times in this club. Wherever we went, we've always had good times. But like I said before, uh, Snow Run, Clear Lake, uh, they, they were the best runs that I've ever been on with this club. We had fun on both of them. We used to have a good field meets. Field meets, we'd, we'd meet them, and they'd play games on, them, on their bikes. Remember where they used to take a, a balloon, put it on the on your 
pa uh, passenger's helmet. You tape it on there, and then you take a, a roll of paper and roll it up, and you try and bust the other sides there, and they try and keep them from it. A lot, a lot of games they played, which was good then. How many people would be on the bikes when this is going on? Well, there's, there's a, like the guy and, he, and his girlfriend or his wife would be on one bike, and then the balloon would be on her helmet, see? and then the other girl would they're going to try and bust it. Yeah, they just had a lot, a lot of games we played, which was good. I, I thought. Yeah, those those balloons. Something different. Things, that was one on one, and you just come at each other like the old gladiators. Only we didn't have the big spears, you know. The, normally it was short couples deal, you know. You, your passenger was the one that was swinging the newspaper, and you kept them trying to run over the other guy. It, it, it was it was fun. It was uh, slow races. Uh, in and out of the tires, you know, the backward and forth zigzag stuff. They were, they, they were fun, good, good, clean fun. We used to have hill climbs that were a lot of fun, too. What would um, you do the hill climb then? We had some pretty famous hill climbers in the club. Wendy Lindstrom was one. Uh, Wendy was, he, he was good. Wendy Lindstrom was uh, one of the nicest guys I ever knew. Wendy and Howard Self, two of the original people in this club, and you couldn't ask to meet two nicer guys than either one of them. They were, they were just fantastic people, both of them. You know, in those uh, hill climbs, there would be a Class C hill climb, and had chains on the back, and then they had a kill button there and around your wrist, and uh, you uh, would wind it up, and the only way you could wind it wide open and bring it down, it's a kill button. He'd wind it up and bring it down. And that way you got your full RPMs and when you go up the hill. Well, this was 220 feet. Gary Langstrom broke the record. He did it in, in four seconds. And of course, Wendy and, and Sam Marina from the San Jose Dons, they were the tops. And then of course, Turkle Top and, and Gary Langstrom with Wendy's son. They also did it, but these bikes was all modified. Their front tire was mostly just about flat, and your back tire, you know, it wasn't. But they had those chains, and those chains were they called them piler. Well, you got a regular chain around your your tire, then you had these little couplers, extra little chains you put in them, and if you had too much traction, you'd take some off, and if you needed more, it was uh, it was them guys was. Seriously, about, and when they go up, and they, like I say, you get one of them, they're all souped up, and they'd go, and if you didn't get on that button right to bring it down, man, it, it went, you know. So it, it was pretty exciting. We, we used to have them uh, at least twice a year, and uh, we got big crowds, but I don't, they don't do that around this area here anymore, I don't think. But anyway, it was good. Oh, I used to go down and help him and set up the hill. You, you line the hill and you got that big rope up the top down, you know how you'd so on. So uh, then we had, of course, refreshments and everything. So it worked out good. We enjoyed it. Now, Don Turkletop was a hill climber. He was, uh, there's was, there was another old timer. And unfortunately, Don's dead, just like Wendy and Howard. But uh, uh, Don, was, Don was hell on a hill, man. He, 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 he didn't trophy very often, but he sure tried hard. And, and, and when he crashed, he crashed spectacular. <laughs> and Wendy's son, Gary, Gary was a hill climber too. And uh, Gary, Gary was good. He, he was real good. Never the same caliber as his dad, but he, he was a good rider, a good rider. I'm hoping Gary will show up here today. I'm hoping he'll bring his mom down. Lindy is uh, another great person. Yeah. Well, that uh, little, that's a little model at Wendy's Hill Climber up there in a bar. Mm -hmm. That was made in, in 53, I think it was. I made that out of, out of wood. I just wanted to give it to him, and then I never did do it, and finally I let it go. Anyway, you get an idea, a lot of the, uh, people don't know what a Class C hill climb was. It ain't like these other hill climbs, and where they use chains now. With the, today, the the equipment they've got and the type of tires and everything they got now, I think the Michigan still has 
of the Class C and Class A hill climbs. But, but uh, then they changed the trend on it. Now they stretched the frames out. And to me, they, they, to me, they wrecked it there. They, they want to keep it like it is. That's where the skill was, you know. We used to, we used to ride them to the hill climb and, and take something off and then ride the hill. Uh, that, that's the way we used to do it. I had a little flathead 45 and uh, we went to the Richmond Hill Climb, Richmond Ramblers. And all I did was change wheels with a, with a friend of mine because he had a, a knobby tire on the back and I had a highway tread. And he asked me if I was going to ride the hill and I said, I can't ride it with that, with that tire. And he said, well, hell, he says, take mine. So we just switched wheels and I rode the hill climb in, in Richmond. Yeah, but he didn't take his headlight off. He mashed it, too. <laughs> of course, I didn't trophy, but uh, I tried hard. Yeah. We used to do a lot of, a lot of things, different things, and, and we always had fun. Now, that's, the, that's the primary thing. Anybody in this club can tell you, no matter what we do, we always have fun doing it. Always. And I don't know anything, anybody that's ever been disappointed with something that we've done, ever. One of the greatest things that we've ever done was building this clubhouse. And, uh, Can you tell us a little bit about building the clubhouse? Uh, well, it, it all started with Don Demers. Well, we, we were meeting at a place out on 99th Avenue, I think it was. Is that, where is that? Anyhow, we, we were meeting out there and uh, put all our money together and kept putting it together. We, we met on 36th Avenue for years, down on 36th in San Pablo. It was a great club hall down there. But we, uh, some big basketball player bought the building, raised the rent out of our reach. So we went out to this other place and we just met in their banquet room. And then somebody found this piece of dirt here and we voted on it decided to buy it. Demers drew up the plans, and we started building, and uh, I, I, I can't, uh, you know, we, we got one of the finest club halls in the state, in the United States, I think. It, it's fancier than, than anybody else's, and it, it's, it's a great place. But the best part of it is, it's ours. It's ours. Yeah. <laughs> He said, our club, we've got some, some steam membership here. He said, we've got one fifth day he's here today. He said, our, he's such a, such a history behind him. They named it beer after him. And he said, what's that? And I said, Big Mouth, that big old Big Mouth. And he said, the name's Chet Gardner. He said, no. <laughs> yeah. About four or five people have mentioned Chet's here. <laughs> to get ready for your year to Ben. <laughs> Did you ever meet his mother? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, she cussed like a sailor, I'm telling you. She ran a bar, I me mean, and him went in there. He gets in there and he mouthed off. Hey, what kind of a police is this? Oh. Now, this new guy has got up the stand there. They thought he was some wild now. She come out to the back, she says, okay, boys, that son of a bitch is my son. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me get this thing over. I'll get out and see let people. Me get out here. You don't need me no more. Right. Okay. okay. I can handle it. All right. Just out of curiosity, are you a member of the club? Yes. Oh, God. I, I thought I saw you. I don't come to many meetings anymore, so. But I thought I saw you here once, but I wasn't sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I got a half a disc in there. I got to get rid of here. And it's half up there. He's got the boat deal on. If I get it finalized, we can run it on the. Uh, oh, you. Oh, you have the uh, little seed. The halfway run. Yeah, half of it's on there, and then I'll get around here and burn it off. Okay. You know? and then uh, I can play it in this stuff. Yeah, I, yeah. I brought all my stuff. In the uh, stuff. I brought uh, another disc already. Okay. It's up on the bar okay. of the halfway. Oh, great. You know? I imagine somebody's already told you how the halfway run come around, didn't they? No. Nobody's told you this? No. This is a hell of a story. Yes, Maybe it is. you can uh, tell us about oh, it. Oh, yeah. This is, we're going to be here a long time now. Oh, yeah. This is I got plenty of tapes. <laughs> <laughs> Big time.
Right. Church has after golf. After golf, then a, a what's, beer. What's your next best one? Golf. <laughs> <laughs> My name is uh, Don Demers. Uh, I joined the club in uh, 1974. Uh, so I guess I've been a member for 33 or 4 years there. And uh, they'd like me to, to tell you about, I'd like to tell you about how the club hall was put together and how it ended up getting into where we could have something like this. Because uh, I was one of the ones in charge making it all happen. Well, first of all, we didn't have enough money when we were over in 73rd Avenue. And so what we did is, we took a little bit of money from the Enduro, and we bought a little place out in uh, uh, South Oakland out there off on San Leandro Street. And it was a little house, and we tore it all down, turned it all around, cleaned it all up, and sold it, and we, now we got $5,000. So then we went and bought another place, and we still didn't have enough money to make a down payment or anything. So we went and bought another place over in Oakland on 98th Avenue, mm -hmm. and we ended up leasing it out. And the reason we had to lease it because we went to the city to see if we could put a club hall there. And this is after the fact, after we bought it. Well, there was a, a church right next to this building, and he was there with all his people saying that we didn't want no motorcycle club next to us that because there's all uh, messing around and there'll be trouble and the girls are in the street and all kinds of bad things which this club is not involved with but he didn't know so we couldn't they wouldn't let us build a club hall or set it up as a club hall so what we did is we leased it out to one of our club members actually leased it for storage and he eventually bought it from us after we a year, but now we had thirty thousand, twenty-five thousand, I think it was. We sold that for, and uh, we took that money and put it in the bank and waited, and we started looking around, and all of a sudden this building came up, and uh, the real estate guy called me, and this Bill, Bill and I went and looked at it, and uh, I liked it. What I saw, I liked. So I thought, well, this would be really nice. We'll see if the club wants to buy it. So we went down, and, but then that bank said, well, we went and made the bank an offer. And then the club voted to do it. But then we went and made the bank an offer, and the guy turned us down. He says, I'm not going to let it go for that little bit. Yeah, I said, well, we can't afford anymore. That's all we can come up with. So he said, I, he said well, give me a phone number if anything happens. Well, all of a sudden, the place come up under foreclosure. So the guy, actually I had a cabin up in the mountains, and the guys came up there, or didn't come up there, excuse me, he phoned us. And, and he told me, he said, well, we're ready to take that dump and you offer this. That's exactly what he said, it's exact words. And so uh, I said, we went back on Monday and we, we closed the deal and bought the place. So then what we had to do is figure out where we're gonna get enough money to build this thing now, that we got to build it. But the first thing we did, we spent three or four months cleaning everything up and patching the roof where we had money to do and stuff like that. And then they, then they all voted that I should take over the whatever, the leader of it, because one guy should be in charge because you'll never get everybody to work. If it's... So we did and we started working and we started putting things together. And uh, it was one year, almost exactly one year, we finally completed this place in 1983. And as most of you know, this is one beautiful club ball. And this recently, because of our income from the sites, they were able to add all this on. So that's how this place came about. And, uh, Terrific. Right? Very good. And every single, <laughs> that's, that's every, good. every single member in this club was here. Saturday and Sunday. Most, some of them were here every Tuesday. Every Tuesday we worked, and every Saturday and Sunday we worked. Mm. And uh, 
uh, Don Turkle, Tom, as you've heard on the tapes before, and all those yeah. guys were all here. Doing it. And our old floor out there, Don Turkletop helped me lay that on a Labor Day weekend, just the two of us. The big floor that was out there. And you can't see it now because they put a new floor down, which is good, because the little black spots in there was the Don Turkletop kept putting too much stuff. Too much damn uh, uh, glue down, and I couldn't get him to put it on thin, and then I knew it was going to come through, and I couldn't stop him. <laughs> well, that won't hold. You know. If you knew Don, you knew what I'm talking about. So anyway, it all ended up great, and uh, now we've got all new floors in here and the new roofs and everything. And uh, like I say, a lot of people put this together. Actually, people bought things. Uh, Charlie Booth and his wife bought that heater that hangs here, for example. John Dunn bought all the sheetrock in the place. Myself and Don Turkletop bought those four beams that are up there. Yeah, and electrical was put in. Yeah, and Don Hitchcock donated all the electric. So this was a good thing. This is how we got it done. It didn't cost any, you know, the club didn't have enough money to do it all at once. So this is the way to do it. And then we, we all bought stocks. And this is something a lot of people don't know. We bought stocks in the building. To pay off the, the debt. To pay off the debt on the building. Yeah. And then after we started getting more money in from Enduros and whatever we were doing at the time, and poker runs and all that, we were doing road runs and everything, we gradually paid off the stocks. Yeah. And there was no profit in it, it was just sitting there. You know, so, but it, that's how we got the whole place cleared. And it belonged to us. Right. And all that stuff's paid for now. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> I joined this club through my wife, actually. My wife's father and mother were members of this club in the 40s. Uh, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Jack. Jack could be. Yeah. And so I met a lot of the writers through them, because then I had this cabin up in the mountains, and they'd all come up with their bikes. And I started, boy, this looks like the life for me. <laughs> and I got involved in it yeah. with a little Honda 90. <laughs> Gotta start something, right? Huh? Gotta start something. Yeah, well, I, that's when I started work, running around the hills there, and I really liked it. Then I went bigger and bigger. And yeah. After a while, I had the biggest motorcycles that they sold for the streets. <laughs> what kind of bikes have you had? Uh, I had two 1300 Kawasaki's. I had a lot of dirt bikes, but I don't remember them all. Because my kids rode them, too, at that time, when we were young. And I had... Uh, then I went up to the uh, Suzuki, no, okay. this, I think I had a Suzuki, yeah, the Suzuki, what was that, a 1400, yeah. Yeah. Or no, that, yeah, Suzuki 1400, yeah, mm -hmm. that's what it was. Then I had, uh, then I got the Honda 1500, and now I'm 75 years old, and I found it getting a little hard to hold up that 1,000 pound bike, I'm not, I'm, I don't got no muscle no more. <laughs> So I sold it to one of the club members there. This is good. Uh, uh, James. James. Yeah. I sold it to James. He came over and bought it, and it was in good shape. And he took it on the opening poker run, crashed it, and totaled it. Two weeks, three, maybe, maybe a month after I sold it to him. <laughs> but in the meantime, I wasn't going to buy another one. And then I decided, well, Kept going out in the garage with no bike there, and I've been used to it for four, almost 30, 40 years, actually, even before I joined the club. Even. So I said, well, I'm going to go find this lighter one. So I went and bought a uh, SP, well, it's, it's a uh, PC, PC, PC 800. 800, Pacific Coast 800. And I remember when Charlie Bellman bought one, and we were on the stag run, and we all made fun of him for having that girl's bike. <laughs> but he, when he got out and started to move, we were going 150, 50. He was going 150. So the bike had the speed. It was no problem there. Yeah. So now I own it, and it only weighs 500 pounds. And it's fun to zip around the roads. And I, I take it out a lot of times. I run around town in it. I don't make the long rides in it anymore. That's basically what I've been doing. Right. So, what do you have to say, my friend, Nobby? Well, uh, Gordon E. Robertson, they know me by Nobby. 
And as you say, we've both been there a long time in the club. Uh, supposedly 1951, I joined the club. Before that, I was with the Acorns, which Cliff and, uh, and uh, Boots Curtis and a bunch of the guys We're had formed, had formed uh, the Acorn Club. Well, I started running around with uh, Bellman and uh, uh, Don Robinson, and somehow they conned me in to sign in this paper, and I was an OMC member, see? <laughs> but uh, we've had a, a lot of rides in this place, a lot of cooperation building this thing. He, the, one of the big kingpins on that deal, but uh, as far as motorcycles, I might have owned 20. I still own four. Ride a little dirt. Uh, had a lot, not a lot to do, but something to do with a jackhammer up at uh, Stony Ford. And it become quite successful. And the uh, dual sport to Fort Bragg is very successful. It's a good ride for the club that they brought up. Got a lot of riders running in it. Uh, other than that, a lot of water under the bridge. <laughs> Bobby, I remember the time that you and I and Maverick yes. were sweeping the, the Enduro. Okay. When the gas truck broke down up on top of the hill, remember that? Yes. And we waited and it helped all these guys. Oh. And it got late and it started raining and it was colder than hell. Yeah, yeah. And remember, we, we had got right, the, right short couple guys getting them off the hill yeah. behind their dirt bikes, you know. And yeah, but it was so cold. We stopped when we stopped down there. We were like this. We were just literally shaking. We were freezing. Oh yeah. I mean, we had gear on, but it was just cold and wet. Damn. And we got into camp, and now we brought out that fifth of. Sc I mean, uh, you were Maverick. I forget who brought well, it. Jack that. Daniels. Wasn't the it? Jack Daniels. <laughs> Very we good. damn near killed that thing right there. <laughs> and it actually it warmed us up. Yep. <laughs> and that's one of the things I remember yeah. doing with you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Right on. Every OMC member should have a full bottle of Jack Daniels in there. Uh, right? <laughs> if, you, if you need it after a run like that, you that should have it. so cold. Oh, yeah. I think it was colder than I've ever been in my life. Right. Yeah. That is. Of the, uh, uh, Sheet iron runs have you been on? Oh, the uh, sheet irons or the jackhammer? Jackhammer, uh, you mean? Both. Well, the I, the I don't think I missed very many jackhammers at all. I, I went to the first one, uh, and I, I guess I went to at least 10 before I quit going. And, uh, Maybe more. I, I don't know. The dual sports? Uh, I don't think I missed one. I'm not sure. That's what I understand. I think <laughs> you're the only person that is. Into every single one of them. Well, you can't make them all, but we all try. Yeah. If you enjoy riding, you'll be there. <laughs> I like 30 years now, no, 20, it was 28 years this time. That was the halfway run. This is 28 years that's been going on. Wow. And which means 14 of those is bad what they, because it's every other year. You got every year. Mm -hmm. And the way that started is, we had a run that uh, we put together. We were going to Canada. First time I'd ever, we, any of us were going to Canada with about 10 or 12 members. And we got up there and this guy, uh, Clarkston, saw all our bikes in the motel and saw our colors hanging on them, you know. So he comes in and he talk, talks to us and he says, Gee, you guys got the same colors that we do, and, uh, but they don't, they're opposite. They're actually black and orange and more orange and black. And uh, he said, I'd like to go get my club and you guys can take a ride with us. We'll take you up to the, the ski run hill. You know, not knowing anything there, that was great for us. So we went on up there and they showed us all, drove us all around and everything. They were stopping traffic in town to let us, <laughs> it was really weird too, you know. And then, and then of course they took us to a place where the girls were dancing. That's pretty popular, I guess, in, uh, well, I know it is, in, in Canada. <laughs> but then uh, they got in contact with us later, and their road captain, who later got a wreck and died before the halfway run, but he had set it all up. And that was our first one. 
And after that, it grew and grew and grew. The first one had a lot of people because we invited a lot of outside clubs, too. We had too many, so next time we didn't invite anybody, just the two clubs. Mm. But this has been a blessing to our club. Yeah. And anybody that ever been there one knows that this is one of the greatest in the union. Bunch of good guys up there. At yeah. times, we went to Canada and they've opened their house for us. Oh, yeah, all you know? the time. Yeah, I was oh, they, they would really be mad if one of our members came to Vancouver and did not look for a place to stay. Yeah. They, they went to a motel. I just came back up there. After the halfway run, I went up and I stayed five days in one of the members' houses. But this happened when we had that, we went to the expo uh, in Canada. What was that, 10 years ago now? Yeah. Yeah, well, we had 32 people that went, something like that. And they built them out all through their homes, all over Vancouver. Yeah. And took care of everybody. And, you know, it was really a setup. We even I had it worked out so if you, if the people smoked, only the smokers went to there. And it, was, it just came out so beautiful. And after that, we keep meeting them. Well, they're, they're down here all the time. Yeah. Wait, well, when my 50th anniversary was here at the club hall, there was six of them, six or eight of them that came down, flew down just for my anniversary. But we've been friends for 30 years. Well, another thing, a bunch of them come down to our jackhammer from uh, up there and ride. And they go on the uh, And then they go to Baja with Mark and his yeah. crew. I went down once with them. And uh, they brought eight guys to ride the dirt and the oil going down to Carbo. Well, they also are, isn't a few of them there at the Sheehan? Oh, yeah, the yeah. whole trailer load. Yeah. Yeah. I know Jim came down. Yeah. So they have, that friendship with them has been a really great thing for this club. Right. You want to run out of things to say? Yeah, I'm done. Good. You're what, 75? 75. Don is 75. I'm 80. We both intend to be running uh, with the club and doing all we can to make it as good as it is or better. For the rest of our lives. I hope so. Yeah, and at this time in our life, you never know when that is. <laughs> right. Yeah, hi, um, Vermin Kelly, Yonkers Motorcycle Club. Is it John? Same club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, we're from Yonkers Motorcycle Club, we established 1903. Uh, we come out to celebrate Oakland's 100th anniversary. Uh, and uh, We've been uh, kind of contact since uh, San Francisco got in touch with us back in the mid 80s and we've been constant touch with them. They're the second oldest club, we're the oldest club. Uh, we've been close contact, having a great time, a lot of good, a lot of good guys. Uh, I've been in the club 23 years, a lot of changes, we're all little kids then, now uh, in the 50s and... Big kids. <laughs> yeah, we're just more, more big kids. But uh, yeah, we're all, uh, mostly Harley, Harley riders in our club, but uh, you know, we're open to just about anything. We're AMA number six. Uh, and I'm blind. <laughs> well, I, I, I've been a member for two years. Uh, my brother uh, has been a member for 20 years now with, with Vermin. And uh, I retired as a New York City detective. And uh, I finally could get involved in something that was, you know, take up some of my time. And I was lacking brotherhood, you know, for a while there, and I need to find it again in, in the club. That's what it's all about. So I'm very uh, fortunate to have, you know, these guys are my brothers now. And uh, I'm honored to be out here because I'm really big with history. And uh, I think it's great you guys are celebrating your, your 100. And I wish you the best. What kind of runs do you guys do out here? Is, is there, okay. Do you have some established like, runs like every year? Is there super runs that you Yeah, we have a. Uh, Joe Cool Poker Run in uh, the end of August every year. Uh, it's been going on. One of the members of our club, Joe Cool, was uh, killed in the uh, in the uh, end of the 70s, 
And since then, we've been doing this poker run, and now we, we just call it a, in memory of all our, our deceased brothers. And uh, it uh, draws between 700 to 1,000 people. It's a very big one-day event, and you know, as, as anybody who rides knows what it takes to put on a, a circus like that. But uh, being the club ring magnet that I am, uh, every time I show up, it is pouring, and you know, of course, members, yeah, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the riders do decline, and you get down to a handful of people on a poker run, but you'll still get everybody coming to the party, and uh, it's a great, uh, great one-day event. We do a couple other poker runs during the year, just a smaller back-to-the-clubhouse type of thing, and uh, a lot of club parties during the year. <laughs> like there we go. <laughs> so uh, next year, 2008, we'll be celebrating our 150th. And uh, if any of you guys can come out, I'm sure Vermin, he's got a very large mansion. <laughs> well, probably known as Vermin Acres. And uh, probably take in quite a few of you. So uh, be honored if you guys came out to visit us. Oh, well, we're staying in Berman's house. <laughs> when we first thing, I was like, oh, everybody's going to Berman's house. Like a, you know, it was like, uh, yeah, it was like, well, you, you, you by himself up there, you know, no problem. Everybody's going to Berman's house. Yeah. Like, what? Well, you know, or everybody invite people from all over the place. Well, yeah. guys from the club are inviting everybody. Come on up, come on up. Oh, oh yeah, I told these guys to come up. You can stay at your house. You got a lot of cars. <laughs> what? Them. What? They what? Them for you, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You got yeah. car number seven. Yeah. Like a yeah, free for all. Yep, that's it's happened many times. <laughs> A lot of projects. Great. Great. Oh boy.
come out. How about, how about the Godfather? Hey, look who's here. Uh, my name is Virgil Garcia. Uh, I come from originally from the Philippines. I was born in Manila and uh, I'm approaching my 70th year, uh, October 21 this year. And uh, I've been riding two wheels since I was 14 and the first two wheels I had was a Lombretta. It was a 150 LD. It was an Italian maid. It was given to me by my dad who never told my mother that she's going to give me a two-wheel motorized vehicle. So the funny thing here is when it was given to me, it was like uh, a cloak and dagger thing. They, he unloaded this uh, from a 6x6 six six army truck because my dad was with the service and he was in Clark Field. And I think he got hold of this. He knew that I wanted to ride a two-wheel, so he brought it down. And this was in Manila during, uh, I would say, maybe about 1953. And the thing here is, that when he gave me the, when he unloaded the bike, he showed me the manual, but they were all in Italian. There were just pictures to say which is the shift, and which is the the the. Uh, the throttle grip and the brakes and there was no way how could I take it home from Manila where we used to live and then we moved over to Quezon City which was about 17 miles and this was way way out back and at that time it's only 17 miles from Manila to in Quezon City but when I learned how to ride that it took we I left the place where he unloaded the bike in a marketplace. It, I left about 10 o'clock in the morning. I was home by about 11 in the evening. And that's about how I learned how to ride the, the uh, two wheels from a scooter. From then on, I started to uh, practice and then I gave up the scooter. I went to a 305 Honda Hawk. And then, six, then 1961, we came over to the United States and the first uh, motorcycle I had again was a 305 Honda Hawk. And it was a breeze to ride that. And uh, that's the beginning of my love for motorcycling. And I thought all along that I knew how to ride a motorcycle because I learned it to the, they, they call it the, uh, uh, you know, learning to experience. So there were some skills that I don't know if I developed it right, but then when I joined the club, the Oakland Motorcycle Club 1990, and it was Don Pitcock who introduced me to this club, and uh, there I knew that the skills I developed were not sufficient to be able to ride with these guys here. And uh, it's, it, to me, right now, OMC is like a family to me. There are persons, individuals in this club that I believe has more or less gotten me closer to what it feels to be, uh, to use the word in close quotation, a foreigner. And they have shown uh, a sincerity in being there with you when uh, things are necessary for you to learn and to be able to give and to give back. So it's to me, uh, OMC is every time there is a meeting, I'm so excited to go to those meetings on Wednesdays. That's why the first year I was a member, I already earned the, uh, uh, the wings for being, not, not having an, any Wednesday, which was absent. So that was very uh, significant to me. Because like they say, every time there's a new member that comes in, they would say that it's pretty tough to be able to attend, was that 53 or 52 Wednesday meetings a year, to be there constantly. So 
that's one thing that I think I have, I would say, is an accomplishment through the help of the members around me. And uh, uh, there's a lot of rides that I went through, and there's a lot of fun times that we had too. But there's one particular uh, ride which I'll never forget because uh, this was the first halfway run that I attended and we were going to Coburg and uh, my bike then before was the a BMW R80 ST and I tried to ride with these guys but apparently it seems like I seem to be on the end all the time they, they, because they, they ride so fast but safely though not the reckless type of ride and I can understand that so I said maybe if I get a bigger displacement motorcycle I'll be able to ride with them so, so uh, soon after the there was a there was this big preparation for the first halfway run I was supposed to attend I think that would be the the it would be the, uh, the about the 92s or I think 91 and uh, when I did that I bought this used Goldwing and 1100 uh, it's red and it was the first time for me to ride it in a highway so anyway I was able to go to that halfway run I got introduced to these guys there and it was the first time for me to meet Gordy and he's really I would say a very big lovable bear he can carry you whenever he likes to because he's a big strong guy and uh, I learned to uh, find out about the uh, relationship between the uh, GVMC and the OMC. So that was a nice ride for me because it was the first time for me to ride through the freeway from Highway 5 all, all the way from California to Oregon. And it's a wonderful feeling when you have this big bike because it's so, so stable and so steady. So that was one part of that. And the next ride I took was the first uh, stag run. And this was something that for as long as I am with the OMC, and I think for as long as I can tell the story about this, this is something that I would always remember and think about. Anyway, this ride was the uh, stag run, and our destination was so secret but we found out it was going to Tonopah and then going to Tonopah that's part of Nevada you have to cross the Sierras which is uh, highway 120 I think it's uh, the uh, north side of Yosemite and you cross that and then you hit a certain highway and then you go in so I rode that uh, uh, trip with the guys of the OMC and uh, boy it was really nice because when you have a big motorcycle with a lot of horsepower you can really you really know how to travel but then even if I had that big displacement bike still these guys are way ahead of me I can't seem to catch up with them so anyway uh, there was this incident in uh, uh, I forgot the name of the highway that's uh, on the uh, north side of Yosemite going to uh, uh, it's closed during uh, winter and they there's no uh, snow uh, snow plow that takes care of it they just let the summer melt down the ice so anyway uh, we went to that the ice has already melted but there was some some still ice on the side and we were just zooming on those areas and then there was a bend that more or less not really that bad but you can make it if you really know the technique of how to do it but then uh, I was always uh, depending on the gearing of the motorcycle and the comfort of the heavy bike so when all, all of them were starting to make turns I tried to do the turns too but then I think I was just going too fast in the turn so I skidded on the side and uh, 
well, that, that's everybody knows how you feel when you, when you fall on your side. <laughs> so anyway, the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, I forgot the name but of, of the guys that, uh, that stay behind. Uh, and uh, there was a Lee Sherman and George, uh, Mm. That's, that's, the, that's just the husband of Sheila, uh, who was behind, and they saw me, and uh, they said, hey, what's wrong? I said, oh, well, they know I was down there on a, some kind of a very shallow uh, ditch, so they helped me out and brought back the bike. It was kind of heavy, and they helped me out, and we brought back, and they just brought some some dirt and some uh, branches of the bike and of myself and I rode the bike again. And then we were on this Tonopa place there which was like a, it's like a whoop, it, that's a lot of whoop we do, <laughs> just up and downs, up and downs. So we were on this road, that was my, uh, that was, we were on this road and uh, we just kept going and then there was another turn. And it says there, uh, on before the turn would come in, it would say a 35 mile per hour turn. So I said, okay, I tried to slow down. But then when I was looking at my speedometer, I was doing 60 on the turn at 35. So there's no way for me to be able to, to make the turn. So here I was trying to make the turn, but I did not. So I just plowed right into the sand. And uh, I guess when I did that, the... <laughs> the front of the bike just buried itself and the next thing I knew was I could see the sky and the ground and then I just fell down and when I fell down uh, there's again uh, Lee Sherman and George Bacon okay I remember they were back helping me again and then uh, I heard on the uh, CB radio on Lee Sherman that says they said that uh, write her down, and then uh, I could hear that uh, who is it? He says it's Virgil. Then I could hear Larry Fry and uh, one of the guys again. I I'll try to recall his name. He said not again. He said, <laughs> well, uh, that was maybe I would say about close to noon time. The first the first down I had was about maybe nine o'clock. And this is the second time about 12. So at any rate, uh, they, tried, they tried to help me. And the bike was really, I would say, not really buried, but there's a lot of sand in front of the wheels. And they were trying to lift it. And they tried, I tried to help lift it too, but they did not know that I was sitting on the handlebar. So we could not, I, we could not lift it all together because I was sitting on the handlebar itself. <laughs> So at any rate, this is one of those things that more or less uh, uh, made me feel that, oh, these guys really go out of their way to really uh, be with somebody who's really, who really needs assistance. So at uh, that time, we were able to upright the bike again. But this time, it had some damages. The plastic was uh, ripped, but it didn't fall apart, The uh, one of the the uh, side mirror on the right was about to fall. So I think uh, George Bacon had some duct tape in it and we uprighted the bike. We tried to start it, it wouldn't start, but then it started again and then we could hear, hear a lot of rattle inside because sand went into the, uh, ti I mean, the timing belt and it would, you could hear it, but it would soon, it just disappeared. So we put the bike together and uh, I didn't tell them that I was, my shoulder was hurting and uh, my left arm was really, it's really, uh, I could, well, I could bear the pain, but I just wanted, didn't want to tell them, you know, it's trying to be a, um, a macho guy with this macho man, <laughs> so things like those. So when we were, when the bike was running and it was uh, rideable, we proceeded again. So we met all the group in, uh, before the entrance of Tonopah. And there was, um, oh, Kurt Lambert was there. He was the one, 
and uh, Larry Fry, and then so we stopped there. I stopped there, and they asked me, "How are you?" I said, "I'm okay. Yeah, I just hurt a little bit." And uh, they started to give me some tips on how what to do. So all along, all these guys, they say, use the friendly gear, which is the third gear, every time you are riding on uh, on turns because it's easier for you. And when you do make your turns, try to press on the left handle handlebar if you're going left, and the right handlebar, and don't turn the the handlebars of the bike itself, just press on it, and it would go where you would like to go. So those are the things that I learned from uh, these uh, members of the OMC. And uh, when we, were, we arrived in Tonopah, it was uh, mm, the godfather, <laughs> which is, uh, um, now I seem to have senior moments coming up, uh, like to, uh, Don Demers was the godfather they call, and he had a room that was prepped up for, to have the, like, you know, when all the members come in, they, they have their own drinks and bring some ice, and they ask me if uh, I can come. I said, no, I think I'll just settle for staying in my room, so more or less I could, uh, Recover, that's the word I used. So what I did was uh, uh, I went out, bought some, a box of Epsom salt and put a, uh, some warm water in the tub and poured the Epsom salt and I soaked myself. And uh, true enough, that helped me because there was no swelling the following morning. <laughs> so, and then from then on, I just uh, listened to the advice that they they told me that when you do things, you just ride the friendly gear, which is the third gear every time you do that. And to me, uh, it's, it's so, uh, um, shall I say, uh, encouraging to, to hear these advices and tips of learning how to ride. And I thought all the while I knew how to ride a motorcycle. So that's the most interesting and uh, the most uh, memorable ride I will never forget. And uh, I would say that OMC is my second family wherever we are and whatever we do. I'll stay with them. Well, uh, OMC, uh, I will always love you. That's about it. I got affiliated with the club uh, because my mother and dad belonged to the club years ago. And uh, I used to ride on the motorcycle between them uh, when it all runs until I had my brother and then there wasn't room for four on the motorcycle. <laughs> so then I got to be babysitter. Uh, but I sat on Santa Claus's lap uh, the old club hall for many, many years, uh, and this is how I got into the club, and I, uh, my, and then I got married. My husband didn't know anything about my husband, and so I, I had friends in the club, and we kept in, being invited to different events, and they said, why don't you get a motorcycle? He says, I don't ride a motorcycle. And so finally he got a motorcycle, and, um, uh, I finally convinced him to join the club, and we've been in the club ever since. And it's been a great time, and I, I love all my friends, and it's just been a great time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my name is Shirley Burst. Uh, I'm from San Diego, California. Uh, my occupation, I work for the school district part-time, and uh, I, Joined the club in 1970, and my mother and dad belonged to the club, and that's what made me join. Uh, I rode between them on the motorcycle since I was six years old, and so I was brought up at the club. Uh, so why not continue on? And I got married, and my husband didn't ride motorcycles, and so he said, "Well, come on, I'm not going to join the club." 
And I says, okay, fine. So we were invited to all the events and everything, and then all of a sudden we got on, and they said, you better join the club. You better get a motorcycle and join the club because your wife has got a lot of friends here, and they're going to enjoy it. So he said, then he bought himself a little tiny motorbike that uh, was like, I don't know what it was, but anyway. Uh, he finally joined the club, and I've been in the club for many, many years. I've been in the since 1970, and I can tell you a lot of stuff that goes on in the club, uh, but it would take too long. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to hand the other interview over to my friend here, and she can tell you what we do in the auxiliary on the door runs. <laughs> uh, everybody can tell you what we do on the door runs. Oh, but no. It takes so long for me to do that because they won't have a time to speak. So I'm going to hand it over to her, and you can. Uh, it's up to you, Sophie. Hmm. My name is Sylvia Karen. I've been in the club since 1984. Um, even though I'm not a joiner type of person, uh, Phyllis and Betty just make everyone so feel so welcome, and uh, you just can't help but you know, join sense. them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's been fun. Uh, my husband has been in the club many more years, probably over 40. And when I was younger, I worked at Harley Davidson, and we would go to the old club hall, and I the old Oakland Motorcycle Club, Paul. And I just love looking at their old panoramic pictures and all the history they had all over the walls. And it was just uh, amazing. So um, that's one of the things I love about our club hall is the, the wonderful history and uh, the camaraderie. And um, I do ride dirt bikes. I have ridden. I have. I'm very proud to say I have my motorcycle license for street riding, even Good though I girl. am a passenger. But uh, anyway, I do enjoy it. So. And yes. this is my I, daughter. I didn't mention I rode my, my daughter. Bike, but I'm all done. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Kelly Karen, and I uh, have been in the club officially since 1991. Um, I was actually born into the club by my mother and my father, who is also a member. Um, this is my lovely stepmother, and uh, my uh, father actually joined the motorcycle club in 1964, and I've been to lots of different events, campouts. The Jackhammer is my favorite, I guess, because they started it the year I was born. Um, there's only been a few that I've actually missed. I did leave the club for a short time, but I'm back and hopefully things will be great. I am married to a member, um, his name is Bill Smith, and it's Big Bill, not Little Bill. Smitty! <laughs> <laughs> Smitty. And um, I've, this has become, this has been a family to me for my whole life, a second family. And I love these ladies. It is a family. It is. It's, it's not just a club, it's a family, and we take up care of each other. So I'm going to pass it over to Betty. Hi, my name is Betty Kreidler, and I live in San Lorenzo. I am retired, but I docent on the Jeremiah O'Brien a day a week. Um, we, I've been to every single enduro. I've not missed a one. Before we ever joined the club, my husband rode. <clears throat> And we had good friends, the Duns, and John said to Carl one time, come join the club. And he said, nah, I don't want to. I'm not a joiner. He says, when I win a trophy on your enduro, I'll join your club. Well, that year, there was a knock at the door, and it's John, and he says, come on, Carl, you're going to join the club? And he said, I'm not a joiner. I'm not going to join. He says, you won a trophy. Come on. And they had won the father and son. Carl and Chipper won the father and son that year. I think it was 75. And uh, we joined the club. And I got in the auxiliary in 76 and have been a faithful member ever since. And it is a family. They're just a wonderful group of ladies. We have a great time. Great time. 
And there are tales to tell, but not for publication. <laughs> Pass Thank it on to my God. sister. <laughs> Don't anybody say anything. I'm Phyllis <laughs> Meredith. I live in San Lorenzo, four doors from my sister, <laughs> whom I love dearly, so that's OK. That we're so close together. Uh, I also docent on the Jeremiah O'Brien, but the Motorcycle Club is our first love. My son and my husband decided they needed to do something together when Brian turned 14 and was getting into all kinds of trouble. So Tom bought him a dirt bike and bought himself a dirt bike and they started riding Enduros. Their favorite one was the Jackhammer. Uh, after a couple of years, the same John Dunn said, gotta get a street bike, gotta join us on the street. I said, oh no, everybody gets hurt, killed on the street. Nope, not going to do that. Well, next thing I know, we've got a Yamaha 350, 750, 850, I don't know what it was, big bike. Huh. Rode all over, <laughs> hell and God on that thing. Had a wonderful years of riding. Now we don't ride anymore, but I'm still a member of the auxiliary and I'll never leave them because they are my friends and my family. Watch this little gal grow up. That's right. Watch this little gal grow up. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, I've been here a long time, since 1976. Yeah. Okay, Sheila. My name is Sheila Bacon, and I've belonged to the auxiliary since 1977. And Mark Norris um, was my neighbor, and I had attended many parties at the old club hall, and. The, that's how I first kind of got to know club, some of the club members. In fact, I uh, many years ago, I bowled with Dodie before I ever joined the club. Um, then uh, I met George, and uh, we started riding, and I, did, I saw California, many of its back roads <laughs> on the back of that motorcycle. And then um, George became sick. He had uh, pancreatic cancer and he passed away. And the auxiliary was my family. They, all through the years, have been my family. Um, I have a new husband and he has joined the, uh, joined the club. And we've been in the club, uh, he's been in the club since uh, 2000. So, as a family, we've been together with, with everybody here, um, very close. Um, I almost lost it there for a bit. Um, they back you 100%, no matter what you do. And they do, nobody said anything about the Dobruns anyway. <laughs> Do you have to say something Shh. about our dough runs? We're not done. <laughs> We're not done. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, the dough runs started in um, 1989. Was our first dough run, and we went to Capitola. Um, when we went to leave, my car had been TP'd, and there had been um, beds that were short sheeted. Um, <laughs> All kinds of things that had happened on that one. Since then, we've uh, uh, put saran wrap on toilet seats. Uh, people have lost their teeth. <laughs> yeah, people have lost their teeth. And we've had to pick them up off the floor because somebody stepped on them. And put them in a glass and ask them where, where they belong. And uh, let's see, what else? Uh, and George is, George is the back. only man that ever went on. Oh, it. yes. My husband was, had pancreatic cancer, and he is the only man that has attended the Doe Run, and that was in 1998. <laughs> anyway, I will turn it over to the rest of the girls, and they can tell you what some of the Doe Runs were like. Oh, no. <laughs> the reason George got to come was that Sheila said, I can't go on the dough run because I have to stay home and take care of George. And we said, no way, bring him with you. And he came in a wheelchair and he was all decrepit. And after two days with us, he was up and walking and enjoying life again. 
and even went on a motorcycle run to, he went to, yeah. Baja. to Baja. Yeah. yeah after family. <laughs> Just to, yeah. took a weekend with the ladies. And that's him up yeah. there in the middle with the hat on. <laughs> Okay. okay. Remember, it's 100th anniversary. Yes. Happy 100th anniversary <laughs> of Oakland <laughs> Motorcycle Club. How about if we say one word and continue on? <laughs> <laughs> working. Yeah. Happy 100th anniversary of Oakland Motorcycle Club, Club from, from the OMCA. It's Oakland Motorcycle Club, not OMCA. It's OMCA from OMCA. Yes. Yeah. We're going to say the words Oakland Motors at the club from the OMCA. Oh, okay. We're going to say the whole thing. <laughs> How much tape do you have? Tape number 53. One person says it, and then when we say from, and then everybody says OMCA. Okay, then Phyllis is going to speak because she speaks clearly and enunciates. But that's no problem. Nobody messes up. Okay, yeah, no, yeah, I yeah. Like, yeah. You know. <laughs> We're all going to say it. We're all going to do okay. Happy, Happy 100th anniversary, anniversary Oakland Motorcycle Club from the OMCA. That's really Yay! Cool. <laughs> it's a wrap! <laughs> did you record that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. No, he Otherwise known as Bungie. Uh, I've been a, I live in San Lorenzo, California. I've been a member since 1999, and I am your uh, extremely amateurish videographer who has tried to compile these uh, these couple of videos. Uh, been a, I live in San Lorenzo, California. I've been a member since 1999, and I am your uh, extremely amateurish videographer who has tried to compile these uh, these couple of DVDs here, get these uh, interviews, trying to uh, learn from some of the old dogs, let's say, and uh, try to talk to some of the newer members and see what they liked about the club and such. Um, if you've sat through this so far, there's been quite a bit going on, so I'm going to make this short and sweet. Um, like I said, I've been a member since 1999. Uh, I was looking for a... Uh, Thing called a dual sport, which is a half dirt, half street motorcycle. I like to mostly just ride in the dirt, uh, but I wanted something that I could cruise on some fire roads and get from point A to point B uh, without getting busted anymore from the cops. Dual sport seemed to be it. Um, so I went to the internet actually and learned about the OMC, uh, gave them a call, and they said, ah, just come on down and have a drink and see if you like the place. So the uh, atmosphere was very, very pleasant. Uh, met uh, Bob Davidson down there, and he was extremely nice and explained a lot about the history of the club. And uh, met a gentleman named Bob Orm, and uh, he was extremely nice, and we had a, some great talks. Um, so those are the two guys that kind of uh, influenced me, let's say, a little bit on actually joining the club. Uh, there were so many diverse people there as far as street riders and dirt riders and the dual sport riders and, and that whole thing, so uh, I was extremely interested in it. Um, I used to ride uh, as a kid uh, all throughout Europe doing uh, motocross uh, and then a lot in the south, uh, Virginia and Alabama and Louisiana uh, where I was living. Um, yeah, enjoyed it very much. Uh, then had a spell there where I uh, wasn't riding so much and I got into some other sports. Uh, they started calling me an adrenaline junkie. We were getting into the skydiving and the base jumping and the bungee jumping and then I decided to turn it into a business and um, 
kind of just focused in on the bungee jumping, hence the nickname bungee. Um, so I did that for quite a few years and didn't have a motorcycle. And a lot of the places that I was out bungee jumping at, I'd see bikes all over and I kept telling myself, oh, I gotta get a bike, gotta get a bike again. And so uh, one time I was out on this one bridge, you know, on a couple hundred feet high, throwing people off on rubber bands, just for fun. Um, and a group of guys come by and I noticed they had license plates on their dirt bikes. Talked to them for a little bit, super cool guys, and they said, oh yeah, it's a dual sport thing. You can ride the trails and then go off and hit the roads and cruise all over the place. Uh, so that's when I started looking into it and uh, I got myself one of those bikes and I've had it ever since and I've beaten the crap out of it and it still keeps ticking and still keeps running. The, uh, the OMC uh, put on a dual sport run called the uh, Sheet Iron 300 and uh, the first time I did it I thought it was going to kill me. It was uh, very, very long. I wasn't used to it, um, but the trails were unbelievable. They were, they were perfect. They were so much fun and, uh, and just super long. And uh, this is up in the Stony Ford area, the Mendocino mountain range. And uh, it was just amazing. It was, it was just such a great time. And all the people just hanging out, uh, you probably heard it throughout the whole DVDs about the, the family thing. And it really is. It's like one big happy family. Um, but even more so than family, you get a lot of friends, and not so much for just the big rides, but it's the little stuff that happens uh, during the week or on weekends. Uh, maybe there's a, a ball game to go to, and you call a couple of guys, yeah, let's go to the ball game. Uh, it could be, uh, uh, you know, Super Bowl stuff, playoff stuff, uh, um, fights or something. And you just, you call people up, you have wives and girlfriends and kids and everybody just comes over and it just makes for a really, really good time. And yeah, most of the time we just sit there and talk about motorcycles and, and the other games are kind of sideline stuff, but we, we have a blast with it all. Um, so it's all that kind of stuff that just really makes this club a special kind of club. It's a good club. It's a fun club. And... When these guys, it's, it's all about riding though too. They they make it happen. If if some little there's little glitches and some kind of ride that comes up, just within a half a day they can turn around and say, okay, we're gonna go over here now. We're gonna we're gonna ride this section. We're gonna ride this area, and uh, and that's what's really awesome with this club. Um, <clears throat> I'm married to uh, Anita, and we have a little girl, Brenna, and um, she's. Uh, Working on being, uh, hopefully, one day, uh, one of the OMC's mascots, I guess you call it. She loves motorcycles, any kind of motorcycle. She loves the sound. It was one thing when, when we had her, I was kind of worried about, you know, the loud noise and the whole thing. And uh, it must be in the genes because she's never once cried or anything. Uh, I give her rides on my bike and she just says, go faster, go faster which, uh, you know, scares mom half to death, and I'm sitting there going, this is cool. <laughs> so, um, she's awesome. Um, got her little TTR 90, four years old. She's not riding it yet, but we ride it together, and it's getting her to know what, what speed's feeling all about. So, um, hopefully someday we'll have a uh, woman supercross champion in the making. We'll see what happens. Uh, if uh, if I was to thank the people from the OMC, I'd basically just have to take the roster and just start at the top and thank every single person that uh, that I've been associated with with the club. Every single person is, is fantastic. Um, everybody's always been cool to me, and hopefully I've been cool to them. And uh, it's it's just been really a, a pleasure. Uh, hanging out and hopefully for a long, long time from now. I uh, absolutely want to uh, say happy anniversary, happy 100th anniversary to the uh, Oakland Motorcycle Club. And uh, I, I hope that uh, my small part in the club will, will uh, do something. Uh, maybe we can cont continue some of these uh, type of uh, DVDs and, uh, and uh, prolong the history of the Oakland Motorcycle Club. Uh, and maybe some of the other motorcycle clubs, like including the uh, 
the Yonkers Motorcycle Club, which is the oldest motorcycle club in the world, um, and our sister club, the uh, San Francisco Motorcycle Club. They're a great group of guys. All those guys are really great. Um, it's always fun to see them at the Sheet Iron um, and, uh, and the Jackhammer and the other events that we go to. Um, but in closing, I, once again, this is not the side of the camera that I'm usually on. I'm usually on the other side of the camera. And, uh, go Raiders. That's right. Uh, happy anniversary, OMC. Uh, I'm very, very proud to, to be a member. And, um, looking forward to the next as many years as we can make it happen. Thank you.